regular meeting of the Richmond Board of Education will come to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Sandy, if you could please read our mission statement and take roll call. At Richmond Community Schools, we provide a quality education that empowers students to be successful in a global community. Uh, we'll call out Candace. Here. Deb. Here. Kelly. Here. Angela. Here. Danielle. Here. Margaret. Here. And I am here. We have a quorum. Thank you. I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Support. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I'm looking for a motion to appro approve the consent agenda. So moved. Support. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm sorry. I know. I went right by it. Sorry. I apologize. Uh, any discussion, Mr. Wormsley? In front of you should have a, an updated personnel report. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Field to introduce our um, resignation, <coughs> retirements, and new hires. For resignations and retirements, we have Sandra Richards, head cook at Richmond Middle School, uh, Brian Shorman, uh, Richmond High School um, varsity girls basketball coach, Jeanette Trevaro, which we approved at the last meeting, resigned as voting cook. Um, for new hires, we have Michelle Maples, music teacher at Richmond High School, Richmond Middle School, and Angela Harmon, science teacher at Richmond High School. Um, for new notice of appointments, we had Jody Baran, um, Christy Crampton, Jessica Schley Hubert, and Christina Waller Riley as after school tutors at the middle school. Jeffrey Kristowski is going to be taking over for the um, high school girls basketball coach. And Brandon Day is the winter uh, facilitator. And I believe uh, Mrs. Maple thought she was going to be here, but I didn't see her. She's the music teacher that will be uh, joining us. Uh, Mrs. Maples will start uh, January 3rd, and then um, Angela Parman, the biology teacher, will start uh, December 20th. There were no errors or any uh, other issues brought to my attention regarding the minutes from the uh, November 22nd, 27th, excuse me. Uh, claims and accounts, um, I had one about a, a bill, but it was resolved just in the timing of when things are received, why the check got um, delayed. Any questions for Ms. Wormsley? Yes, the uh, basketball, girls basketball, is this temporary and we're going to post the job or what, what is this? This, yeah, this would be to finish out the season while we post and find a permanent solution. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next item on our agenda is our student recognition for the holiday cards. Mr. Walmsley. Good evening. Every year for the last several years, the district has done a holiday card, whether it's sent to parents or put in the community or through newspaper advertising, just wishing our community a uh, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. This year, we had asked for entries from our students uh, at each of the three levels, going working with our art teachers. There were multiple entries that were submitted, um, and we had the difficult job of narrowing it down to just ten. Um, these 10 entries will be uh, printed on our holiday card and mailed to not only our families in the district, but also neighboring districts, um, um, boards of education on behalf of the board, as well as some of our businesses in the community. So um, I'd just like to take a minute to read the message that will be put on the card. And the message is, uh, reads as follows. As we approach the festive season and the spirit of Christmas fills the air, I want to take a minute to share a message of joy, gratitude, and unity with each and every one of you. This holiday season is a time for reflection, compassion, and coming together as a community to celebrate the values that bind us. This holiday se season, let us cherish the bonds that make our community special. 
It is a time to appreciate the diversity that enriches our schools, to embrace the warmth of friendships, and to extend a helping hand to those in need. The holiday season serves as a reminder that despite our differences, we are united by a shared commitment to the well-being and success of every individual in our community. May this Christmas be a time of renewal and hope for all. Let us carry forward the lessons learned from the past year, fostering an environment of empathy, understanding, and collaboration as we exchange gifts and enjoy the festive gatherings. Let us let the true spirit of Christmas shine through the acts of kindness and compassion and goodwill. Because my signature's on it, it says, I want to express my deepest gratitude to our dedicated educators, staff, and volunteers who work tirelessly to create a positive learning environment for our students. Your commitment to, and to excellence in the well-being of our community does not go unnoticed. To our students, may the joy of learning and the excitement of discovery continue to inspire you. Your potential is boundless, and I'm confident that you will achieve great things in the coming year. And to our families, thank you for your continued support and partnership. Your involvement in education and the growth of our students is invaluable, and together we can create a brighter future for the next generation. On behalf of the Richmond Board of Education and I, wish you a joyous, restful, and memorable holiday season. May it be filled with love, laughter, and the warmth of those closest to you. So up on the, the PowerPoint, you've seen several of the uh, artists that, that have contributed and were selected. Uh, I believe we have seven of the eight, or seven of the ten artists here. So I'm going to start with um, Chase Lapero, which I believe his mother's here. Chase couldn't be here today. And congratulations on that. Thank you. Elise Allen. Wyatt Sexton. Savannah Rowland. <laughs> Annalise Shagna. Rosa. And Ava Methman. And the three, I don't think they came in after, but the three just to recognize them. Uh, Olivia Guevara uh, from ninth grade. Aubrey Paulwell, uh, who's in seventh grade. And Elena Batani, uh, who's in second grade. So here's the second grade. Thank you, and feel free to take your uh, display as a momentum of thank you. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Next item on our agenda is the Michigan Data Hub and My Kids Back on Track Track Program. Uh, Mrs. Staples. As they are approaching, uh, we have uh, Dr. Alicia Fly, the Chief Economic Officer from the Macomb Intermediate School District. Um, I asked Mrs. Staples and Dr. Fly to come tonight um, to present on these, the, primarily the Michigan Data Hub, but um, to understand why these two are together. Um, there are several grants that we have now available to us in this year's school aid fund. And the way it was written, in order for access to fund, we have to um, get involved with the Michigan Data Hub. And so I wanted uh, Dr. Fly to come with uh, uh, Renee to talk to you about what does that mean and what, do, what is the Michigan Data Hub. So I'll turn it over to you at that point. Awesome. We're just excited to have Dr. Fly with us. Sorry, so like my, I'm just really excited that she's here and she gets to um, see you all here and witness some of the good stuff we have going on here. 
district. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Renee. Um, good evening, board members and students and staff and um, members of the Richmond community. As Renee mentioned, it is always a pleasure to be in the Richmond community and what a wonderful celebration of the students and great spirit of the holiday with the um, holiday message and the opportunity for students to show their spirit and to help everyone get in the holiday spirit. So I um, just wanted to, again, was asked to share just some brief information regarding what the Data Hub is and how some of this has evolved over the, the past few years. And so the, the Data Hub, and I'll, I'll read actually just from the, the site itself, but it's a data repository, um, a collaborative um, that's um, been in effect statewide probably for about eight years. And it is, it is a collaborative, but it's, it's become a, a system and a place, a repository for um, data throughout the state of Michigan. And the effort was to um, help address some of the challenges for school districts in managing um, student and school data. And the work of the initiative was centered around creating an ecosystem where information is exchanged between a large number of disconnected data systems um, used by schools and, and districts um, using predefined standards. And um, it actually, let me give you two examples and I'll, I'll speak about, we haven't really had a lot of our districts um, in Macomb County utilizing the data hub over the past few years because we are, we're fortunate in that we do have a pretty robust um, management and informational technology team at the Macomb Intermediate School District. And as a county, um, I know that you guys know as both board members that we work pretty collaborative together. And so as we, and we have a strong data and assessment team, we have met Emily McAvoy, um, who's presented a number of times um, throughout the county. And so our, our 21 local districts have utilized um, the services at the ISD to meet the data needs for the most part. And in addition to the support through the Macomb Intermediate School District, in our county we also have some pretty incredible technology teams throughout our district as well and so we've been able as a county to meet um, our needs you know over you know the, the number of, of years as requests have come in on ways to present data and still achieve the goal that was being requested um, now mind you you know we um, you know, staff look very different throughout the state of Michigan. And I said that we're fortunate in our county. That's not the case in every county. You know, some counties don't have um, the similar staff with their ISDs or similar support with their ISDs and with their local districts. And so certainly some districts from the inception of the My Data Hub have taken advantage of those services. But I just wanted to put it in context for here in Macomb that our, our districts typically have not. And so just some of the examples of ways that the Data Hub is used. So for enrollment, for example, you know, there's data that is, is entered and managed throughout the system and they refer to it as continuity of services. And one of the intents behind it was that statewide, um, you know, that sometimes it can take a, a while to get student records when students transfer to different schools. And so with the Data Hub system, there is a way that you can, you know, access registration information so that you can start serving servicing students in a, a, a quicker fashion. And because sometimes there are situations where schools or districts may be waiting in um, information, and this process allows um, schools and districts to have access to that information and not have a last lapse in the continuity of services for students. Another way that um, some districts began using the data hub more regularly was around the third grade reading law. There's a, a, a tool that's called MyRead. And so one of the requirements with the third grade reading law is that you had to have an IGREP or intervention plan in place for students. And so MyRead was created as part of this system. And you could take advantage of utilizing that to help manage your IGREP plans. And, and as I said, you know, even with those two examples, we really haven't had a lot of our districts in Macomb County taking advantage of it. 
it really came to into a lot of conversation and I'm looking at Renee we can start one with our curriculum directors and with our superintendents when we when our requirements um, regarding submitting benchmark assessment our local benchmark assessment data changed and so it became required that we had to submit our assessment data to the data hub and initially the request from MDE was that they wanted student level data and I know this won't surprise some of you but we pushed back in Macomb County our, our local school districts felt very strongly that no nope, we don't want to submit our student data if they asked the MISD if you can prepare the data and submit the data in aggregate form that would be our preference and so we were able to do that. We weren't the popular kids on the block in <laughs> doing so, but you know our role as an ISD is to service our local districts, and so that was the request. And we were unified as a as a county um, in doing so, and that's the way we've submitted our data over the past couple of years in terms of our local benchmark assessment. And so it's still again we we have our data and assessment team. They, um, you know, don't mind. They, they feel like it's, it's a part of their service. It's part of our service as an ISD to prepare all of the files. And so MDE listed, and, and I'm not the data technician or the guru, but we received, you know, the script from MDE saying this is how the file needs to be delivered if you're going to submit it um, as a county in aggregate and not at the student, with student level data as we're requesting. And so the past two years, our local districts, you know, submitted our assessment file information. Our statisticians at the MISD prepared it appropriately. And the way we were able to do it is that we did have an MISD folder on the data hub and all of our aggregate information went into the MISD folder. So none of our local districts were submitting directly student level data. While the legislation has changed, and now it's requiring that you do submit um, student level data and it's tied to funding um, with your benchmark assessments and so we have um, you know before we we had all all you know all of our districts who were um, providing their student level data um, as one of the benchmark assessments prescribed by MDE um, were submitted in aggregate file but what the change in legislation we MDE didn't list you know how you had to prepare the file because their expectation is in order to get the funding for your benchmark assessment which is about 1250 per student that you would need to submit um, in a student level manner so we've been working with our districts and preparing that information and at the same time um, we still wanted to be on record that we still, you know, for the benchmark assessments that we would still prefer to submit those in an aggregate manner. Um, we, we don't know if anything will come of that other than just being on record about that because it, the, the legislation has changed and what it's gone from is submitting in an aggregate format um, to the student level data in a form and manner prescribed by, by the department, which is MDE and MDE prefers to have it in the student level format. So that's how the benchmark assessment data has evolved. And as we were having that conversation, um, there are also a number of grants that our districts are eligible to apply for or hope to apply for. I know you guys have been just like all of us have been hearing about opportunities to um, uh, participate and receive funding for summer school programs, for after school, before and after school tutoring programs, and it's a significant amount of money. And so, um, you know, many of our districts have now said, you know, they feel like the writing is on the wall. Not, not only is this being requested with our local benchmark assessments, now all of these uh, grant types, and I know Renee is familiar with the ones um, pertaining to Richmond or that the Richmond community may be interested in applying for, um, you know, it's tied, and now it's tied to funding. So that's what's changed the game. So originally a 35A grant, it would just make you identify students that had IRIPs, how many were serviced, and what categories, math or reading, tutoring, for example. The language of that grant has now changed to where now you have to submit student level data in order to be eligible for this grant that we've always been granted every year. This helps us fund our summer school. Um, it's the um, extra instructional time grant. 
the NWEA grant, for example, the reimbursement grant, um, what Alicia said too was the twelve fifty per student. It comes out to around eleven thousand dollars. There is now wording in that where you have to have your data accessible um, permissions allowed in the data hub. It also is a transition for our MyKit program for the school and district improvement. District improvement is making us, um, and it always has, um, but it makes us pretty much align our, our line items that we are preparing for to a district improvement plan and it is asking us to have a you know permission set. We also applied for, crossed our fingers, and did receive notice that we got a grant called 23G, which you have some information here, the Michigan um, School Back on Track grant, um, and we did get it. Um, the initial, you got, you know, depending on the funding and how many students went up, but it is a possibility for us to have up to $303 per pupil for students that did not pass the AMSTEP or high stakes exam that would be close to nearly $300,000 that we would be not accepting if we are not opting into the hub. However, upon some research, oh, were you gonna do that? Okay, so upon some research, because you know, of course we dove all in, like, oh my gosh, you know, once again, the writing's on the wall, we're kind of seeing that now they're wording things that differently than we've always had, and now they're wording things to where your our hands are becoming very tight with this at the state. Um, so um, we did look into it and apparently there is an option to opt out of the data hub. So we can, on the power school side of things, um, turn a switch and not have that student level data be part of the Michigan data hub. So parents would have the option to be able to opt out. The only part about that is that we don't necessarily know what the what is for that's funding. What I was just going yeah. So, but we, you know, we, uh, and, and again, it's it's a, it's new territory. As, as I said, we've always our choice as a county has been to submit that aggregate file. But now, and when districts ask us for advice on, you know, what to do, like we know the the formula in terms of the benchmark assessments, and we know how to prepare those files but MDE hasn't released any other information on how to prepare, you know, the for statisticians to prepare the files to support the districts. And so, you know, we um, we certainly know that every district is weighing this decision very carefully. And, and again, the, the funds are significant in terms of the impact that it can make in communities. So I, I know that's been a, a big decision for many of our districts. And many of them have now opted into data hub so originally we were you know a county that said no originally um and um, the 21 districts all said no um, however with uh, the new change of verbiage to some of the grant language and some of these stipulations more and more districts are now opting in so we are actually now one of the last districts in the state to opt in districts meaning county or well, local yeah, school district. We don't know for the about the state, state. but you can just speak for Macomb yeah, County. County. So the yeah. yeah. But we were one but, of the last whole counties to even talk about it. Macomb County was the only <coughs> county right. in the state of Michigan that yeah. sent aggregate yeah. files, correct? Like maybe can I think Kent maybe County there was, was one other, other but very So when you look at the number of counties, there was only two and you've heard me say multiple times here we have done everything we can not to give our student data to the state. Okay, that was my question. Can you clarify what you mean by aggregate format versus the That's student level format? Yeah. No, I was gonna say, it's, just, it's pretty much like, um, it, it's gonna talk about all grade nine EDRW scores, for example. It won't have the student level names or anything. It'll just give how many percentages were economically disadvantaged, how many statistically passed, how many um, were had IEPs, how many, and there were no student names attached, but it still gave an overall summary of the score. And now they want names. They want every, so then, yeah, so we would do the, um, you know, so the MISD would do that work previously, and so our local districts, you know, just, um, so well, you had the names. We, we yes, we prepared. We, we prepared. We have the student level data that was rolled up to us. We're all in the same because system. we're all in the same system right. as Macomb, Macomb, Macomb County, yeah. and we submitted aggregate um, the aggregate file to the state, and so they they are requesting the student level data so 
that they can aggregate the way that they would like to and run the reports that they would like to run. So then my, my question, I'm sure you don't know the answer, but so MDE can't understand and can't do their job at an aggregate level they want it at a student level. That is the I mean, point. ultimately, right? That, that is I, what, and I'm not asking you to answer, that's not <laughs> but I, I mean, this, I'm like sitting it. here and, I, and I'm listening and I'm thinking, what, for whatever you want to do with that information, that's you can do it at the aggregate level. It's all there. Yeah. It's telling you. It's just not telling you Jimmy, Sally, Susie, all of that. Right. So I just don't understand where that, but the reality is, if you don't do it, the things that we get and that we desperately need, we can't get anymore. In reality, right? The grants that, and stuff that we apply for. That's where we real. are. It's, it, yes. And you know, previously it wasn't connected to funding in this manner. Now it is, and we're seeing it connected, being connected to more more funding opportunities for our So for years, they've been giving us. They've been we've been collecting on these funds and using them for programs. Mm -hmm. So they've drawn us in. Mm -hmm to get us to rely on the funding. I, I believe in and last now, year's budget, to go along with what you're saying, it said they were referenced aggregate in yes. the school aid fund. Yeah. Yes. Right. This year, it it's now referencing in a manner prescribed by the Department mm -hmm. of Education. I'm just saying, what I'm saying is, we've been, we've been collecting these funds for a couple years, using them for tutoring after school, NWA, I think is what, yeah. what you were saying, um, and now they're changing the stipulation on it, so basically, they're saying they're they're holding us holding our funds hostage if we don't agree to their new terms. I mean, our introductory rate is over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's not just stuff in the last couple of years. There's great. It, it's all going to go into all different things that we get. Yeah. Right. I mean, or not just the stuff that we've done uh, so in been, the last couple of years. That was two examples on. of things that yeah. previously we've always received that have now changed, and then now with 23G, which is introduced to be brand new, there's a stipulation that you have your local data submitted within the hub. So and this is there is, any grants that we've already had approved that have the older language that we can still collect this year Unfortunately, on the way the grant systems work, you apply during the NDE due dates, we get an award letter, and it has to be spent during that fiscal right. year in order for us to be compliant with fiscal management of those grants. Because when we talk about we got to spend that by a certain time, yeah. that's right. what they're talking about, that that money's can't not opt taken in without the without those stipulations. And unfortunately, there isn't, which there was like a grandfather clause that you know, this yeah, is how right. we can do it. At least to team. get by for the whole year to see what other schools do. And So do you have any insight on the other 20 or so districts on what finally changed their mind? Just dollar signs? Yeah. Well, yeah. Probably. They couldn't afford to lose the amount. If we use the benchmark assessment alone, you know, the 12.50 per student and, you know, um, districts budgeted that they plan for that and so that's just a small example I but when you couple that what now the new grant opportunities um, you know the, the districts were like we it, yes the funding they, they the decision was not to lose the funding and, and I will tell you this we don't even know all of the regulations for the grants that were passed in the budget yet so for instance, 31 AA, which is our safety and security, yeah. they haven't even given us direction on, on spending those dollars yet. Yeah. We're giving us the dollars, but not you know, the how to spend so, it. So, and there's some of them that they, they do not expect for a while. Mm -hmm. right. So, And that's, that was part of the challenge for us as an ISD, because we were like, okay, we can, maybe we can help out in a similar manner in terms of how we've done with the benchmark assessments, but we, we couldn't make that commitment because we don't even have the language. We don't know what the expectation is with the file, and we certainly wouldn't want to disadvantage any district and, and have someone miss an opportunity. So, so ultimately, what do they want with this information? Why do they want it so badly? Question. They want their jobs to be easier. There's more to it than they, that. They, they don't <laughs> well, but I'm just saying, suddenly because, because you can't figure, figure out the aggregate, before. so you want this. It's Keep the in mind, same too, thing. that it's also part of the, the request that districts have in their improvement plan to where every single in our federal budget everything that we put in as a line item has to now be associated with a strategy from our district improvement plan with a drop down that aligns a hundred percent to the features that are in the my kit program which is attached to the data hub so before we opted in a my kit without the flow of the data hub but now 
Because we didn't need to. Because we didn't right. need to. We, you know, we had all the aggregate file done for us from the ISD. We were compliant with, I think it was House Bill 4411, because I'm super nerdy. <laughs> and, and now you're seeing that it's eventually, what they want to do is try to create this collective hub where, you know, not all districts have these power schools and all these systems in place. They're, they're, they're totally separate. They're islands. So they're, they have control over everything. It's monopoly. So the MISD was originally against this whole idea. Is that what you what you said earlier that they were? Or was we, it the MISD and the twenty one districts? District. District. So yeah, we we what? we were uh, pleased with you know what we were doing was working for us in terms of submitting the aggregate file. Um, that was meeting the needs of our local districts, and we were absolutely more than happy to do that um, for for our county and. Um, you know, as Renee was mentioning, in our county we have strong systems in place. So we have found ourselves being one of the few voices pushing back, asking questions, where others are, you know, you know, thank you, someone else is going to do this work for us now. Where we were, you know, we were okay with doing the work. Our, our districts were requesting it. You know, we have a team in place. That does a, a great job. So um, that would be our preference. But at the same time, we are making the decisions regarding the funding, and we, we don't want um, to hinder a district's opportunity around that funding. So they're going to have name, phone number, address, grades on every student, IEPs, IEPs uh, on every student in our district. You know, some of that, yeah, some of the information they, you know, already have as part of, you know, how we do right. our work in terms of enrollment People and County. getting student right. count day, That's you know, true. some of that information is, is already available. It really is a matter of, you know, how you're, you know, using the, how you're pulling the data together for, for reporting. That, and, that right. is the reality of it, that that information is already there. And to me, it's just, I it's don't not know why you, to a kid. I don't know why you need this right. to, what, to perform yes. what you've been performing with this kind of information right. and then you're because you want in my opinion do your job easier and you know you don't think that but do your so now you're going to pull money from it money that we need that it's a decision you you can't you can't say no to the dollars right they, they because they're so beneficial they, to what we do cuts and kind us into it they fed us the carrot and now I, well, they, I, away I don't think don't. they fed us the carrot. Well, they've just, been giving us the I funds. Just, right. So, right. I just believe yeah. that along yeah. the way they went, okay, now we're going to do it. Well, it was a plan from the get go. Maybe. Yes. Maybe. I just wonder what the plan is. I also know that right, just as I really do. research on it is that it's what's, not so what's simple as just turning on a, on a switch. You know, there's an entire backside to this hub that you can um, choose what data you're letting flow. So looking at permissions, there's, you know, there's all sorts of things that we, if we're going to go this route, we can look into, work with the ISD and their tech department to say exactly what their minimum, what, what we, do we have to, to sell in so now to meet the fair minimum requirements. Okay. Yeah. So that, that is that's what, the whole thing, too. That is what Renee and I have been doing when we've, when we've um, submitted our intent to apply on some of these, whatever, however you want to phrase it. It's, it's only what they're absolutely asking yeah. for. Nothing more. Well, I guess that's what I'm curious about. I want to know exactly what they're asking for on each student. And until so we get that file. That hub, though, it's all in there. But the reality is you don't know. Until yeah. so we get that file and we, we go get through the process. Right. Yeah. So, so you, you don't know what's in it until you read it. Can we still read it for it. anything that would benefit our district? Is there more to it? Is there something that we as a district will benefit from this data? Using it? Yeah, I mean, it's an entire system where it can completely, you know, analyze a lot of great data for us to use. Of course, you know, you want to look to see how many people are opting out because then, you know, you're yeah. kind of missing some pieces of the puzzle. Um, but it is a tool in that way too. And we can use it to maybe show trends. Trend data, mm -hmm. yeah. Where we maybe are. And short, across the state and among our peers, among among Home County, among the state. Um, I would say it's going to provide us everything that the ISD has been providing. Already us been doing. Right. Already mm -hmm. been providing. So the so, oh, I'm sorry. Go no, good. I'm, just, I'm just saying in this process, we are. Right. We sometimes forget how lucky we are because yeah. our 
Macomb right. ISD I and R21 have really worked together solid for years. Yep. And so we have, like I said, taken this position and we've been in one, maybe two counties that have not. Um, and now as all of these section grants, the only change is for when they write the legislation in the future, they need to say it's aggregate, not up to the department. That is really the only future change that needs to be made and advocating for why do they need it. So well, just the changes I've seen from the school year starting, I, I know this is, this is it. This is the way it's going to do this. So the opt-out option is going to be easy to find and yeah, put, presented I, to all parents. I have our that. account people person look into it and contact another district that utilizes it to be able to see how intense it is and how simple. And it is literally a switch to not have that student's data flow to the hub. So, so what do our artists do? It. So <laughs> what, well, we need to make sure we're clear. It's opt-out. It's opt-out. Yeah, it's opt-out. We need take. to make sure we're clear. What we don't know is when they look at our student count number, and it says we have 1,500 kids, and they look at the opt-out, and it says we have 1,300 kids. There is a risk that if we don't have the numbers matched, we don't know that, that we could lose funding. The extra instructional time grant, for example, the one that they've now changed that language, that's one where they ask how many students are on, you know, math or math or reading support, blah blah blah. And of course, now if our numbers don't match, like what's the what's the consequences? We, I don't know. So when we apply for these grants that now th these are tied to, do they supply the information as to who is the financial backers on these? Um, they'll provide like a, usually an FAQ or like a grant award letter. They'll sometimes just give you kind of that background knowledge of what it's going to be um, used for, the stipulations around the grant, what what use who you know allowable. Normally, funds. it's not just coming from the state. I mean, there's some financial backers. It and does not what go do into they gain? history. Of of two I would I would ask you to track your financial backers to who voted on that legislation yeah, right. and the donation. Yeah. Yep. That's where you need to track it. Yep. Because if it doesn't get to the governor's desk, the MDE, once it's there, they got to implement it. Right. It's the people who are voting on this that ultimately make that decision. And, right. um, and we're kind of getting ahead of this now. You know, like I said, we've seen some changes in the grants, some, you know, little things like NWA reimbursement is not that much. It gives us around 11,000. Um, the 35A, it's not too much. It gives us around 18,000. Okay. Um, the, you know, but once again, <laughs> you have new things coming in that, and you know, we we now set to rely on these funds for this expert, like literally our tutoring, our and and <laughs> unfortunately well, our, our instructional school. time grant, like that's hitting your most at risk kids. This 23G opportunity would allow us to have tutoring, summer school program, extra instructional time, workshops for post-secondary at our high school level. Like that's reaching kids that we wouldn't be able to fund this otherwise. Like how much is our summer school to run it? It's oh, around how much dollars. it costs to run everything. Yeah, around 100 grand. And that's been paid through our grants. Through grants until this year. You know, because that's where three expires. So now we have to be creative if we want these grants to, if we want these programs to continue, we have to be creative about funding. This opportunity came up. I said, you know, let's apply to see if we get it, have the conversation. We ended up getting the grant award, not the actual allocation as of yet, but it can be up to. But the state is looking to see is how many people actually apply for it and receive are eligible right. before they give you the allotment. So just something to think about. We can discuss it see what direction we want to take. I guess what I'm looking for from the board is this, is we're, we're planning on moving forward very cautiously, very um, only what we absolutely have to, unless this group tells me, turn down the money. And I don't even know what money I'm turning down other than 23G <laughs> and NWA, because there's some that we don't even know yet. But if you look at the list of the section grants in the in the budget, there is a lot of one-time dollars in there. That we get a lot. That we get. that we are eligible for, and that we're we've been applying for. And there's no other areas, no other grants that we can apply. They're not counteracting it with anything else. From the state, no. no. This is this is the this is the new so, norm for us. And again, I think we're don't quote me on the number, but a half a dozen districts in Macomb that are left standing. Yeah. I don't don't quote me on the number, I don't know that, but not very many. 
Well, I think in all actuality, like, I mean, I understand where everybody's coming from is not wanting the state to do this, but our students are being tracked and have been tracked. We were tracked. It's all there. I mean, to like, I mean, we might actually see some benefit from this. Where I know no, where you're saying no, maybe yeah, they're doing their job. I mean, not just as a district, as a state, mm -hmm. as a, a nation. There might be some trend data that we might not have seen before if it actually is aligned with people's name, their socioeconomic, mm -hmm. demographic, whatever. So while I know there's a fear there, I mean, we've all opted in to social media. Most of our kids have opted into social media, and let's be real, that's scarier than the Michigan Department of Education to me. I think well, so that's I just where I'm really stand. losing I, is our, our choice, and that's when we give up the choice. Are, well, when you put them in public education, you are making your choice then. Correct. Because it is funded by the state and the county. That's where, what public Angela, education where I'm, is. You were absolutely right. I mean, I did pupil accounting work when I worked at the ISD. You're right. All the stuff's going up yeah. in the yeah. pupil accounting. That's just what it is. That's how we get our dollars. But it's not so going any is, further than the ISD. But, but to me, this isn't that much different. Okay. And I don't, I don't like to be held hostage that if you don't sure. do this, you not get this. Right. You know that's where I'm yes. coming from. I very much am in favor of doing this. My irritation still is, I don't understand my aggregate right. doesn't work. And, you know, maybe that's the next letters that I write. I don't know. But I'm just, I'm not going to, I'm, we need to do this. We need these dollars. We know what the tutoring does for us. Summer. We know what our summer school has knows. done, all of that. It's just. Well, and I think it's an opportunity for us to grow with the extra. There's a reason why we held out them. as long as we did from Macomb. There was a reason behind it. Well, because of the voters, yes. From the well, Macomb I, County demographic, yes. Well, and the reason you held out is because they weren't telling you, if you don't do it this way, you're not getting the money. So you can, it's, it's great and easy to make a stance on something when nothing's being really no, held over your head. Sure. We took a stand that said, we're going to do it this way because we know it works. We know it's accurate, good information. And I applaud that we did it. But the reality is it's harder to take a stance on something when they're holding over your head that these dollars are going to go away and hurt your students. And grants that we don't even know about yet. Like, mm -hmm. even if we all say this isn't for us right now, there could be three, four other yeah. things that come down in the next few years that we're also missing out. And eventually, they're going to make it mandatory anyway. So. You know, just how long are we going to, to miss right. out on funds and opportunities for our students? And I just don't see this going. Yeah. And I'm not that saying way. that ISD we've taken a, making a stand so, something I, that you. I, I, I was just yeah. I was just I making. Can you tell say me this. some more reasons why you guys held out, other than just? We did the letter of the law. Right. Yeah. And that's really it. When you look yeah. at when the, the 21 superintendents <laughs> is my part of the conversation is. We only did yeah. what the law required but us like to do. Said, aggregate and when they started important. asking for other things that weren't specified in the law, we said no. Now they changed the it changed. and said the department gets to And then we talked to design. our attorneys about it too. Wasn't there a conversation about Gary, doing that? Gary well Collins said Gary we Collins. had attorneys yeah. submit letters to the right. draft on behalf of the student about it on the districts and the county. Mm -hmm. um, we sent it. They accepted them to say, okay, it doesn't say per student, we'll do the aggregate. Now it's getting down to the student. Yeah, you're right. The, re the request, you know, it, at, at the time we felt it was be beyond the scope of the legislation in terms of what they were asking for. And it was like, that, you know, that's, we're meeting the, the law in terms of what we're doing. And, it, and again, we um, have a very strong system in place and, you know, felt, you know, at the time that was sufficient. But we definitely, as Renee said, see the, the writing on the wall in terms that the, these requests are becoming more frequent. I think, Mr. Wansley, also that there is an opportunity regarding the data hub that um, it, it's an annual that you would have an opportunity to look at it and yes, you in do terms have, you of do the have authorizations, to you could, you know, so could have time to evaluate and have conversations about how it's doing in your community. Every, every school year you, you kind of renew your opt-in to the system, if you will. And we could see it. I mean, how we can look. Yeah, my, my intent is, and to keep this as transparent as possible, once we know what's specific, yeah. this board's going to get a copy. Here's what they're telling us that we have to send for this grant. And that's all we're sending. We're not doing anything more. Right.
we're taking precautions like setting up meetings with the data and the um, technical construction site at the ISD to help us really understand what preferences, what type of, you know, settings what do we, that we really need, need to, to do, set? what exactly do we have to do for this and this and this, yeah. you know, to be compliant. So, yeah, I just, um, I mean, Angela made some great points, but I, I'm a little leery of this too, and I know that our community certainly is. So I just feel like, and I know that we're kind of got our backs against the wall here, um, but I think going forward, we just have to be very open and clear about the information that is being requested. Um, you know, I think that we have to, I think we owe that to, you know. I think it would be beneficial to also know <coughs> What dollar amount are we actually looking at here? If we were to, and are there any other areas that we can visit to see where more might we might be able to counteract? If we, as far as more money, right? Other grants, other grants, other that ways. are out there from other sources. Yes. My my two cents is everybody needs to write their legislator yes. Yes. and tell them to forget what? these one-time dollars and put it in the foundation allowance yep. Yep. and reduce yep. the retirement costs. Amen. Amen. And what legislation piece got approved that this time? When you look at the school aid budget that was approved by the legislature sign, Every section is a state, section 23G, section 61C that we're going to talk about. It's all listed there. These are considered one-time money. If they put it into the foundation, they have to physically say, we're going to cut you to reduce your funding. And when you have all these sections, you have all the little pet projects of oh, legislators yes. and yes. their constituents or, yes. as you said, or I just follow the money. Right. Just follow the money. And it goes back to that, that same argument, you know, the soapbox I get on all the time, Candace. Give everybody, every school district, the same, same amount money. of money. Bring it up to the $13,000 plus thing, and then these kind of things won't, won't always come into play because right. everybody's getting the same fair amount of money. And then you can judge districts equally by doing that. That's what it comes to. You're getting you're 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 going to these these grants that that are getting and they're throwing these out there because they're not funding us properly, mm -hmm. and so that this is what comes there and this is this is what this is what, what happens. this guy's friend that guy's friend that's what it is. I will commit to this board and this community that as we know it, will be uh, you'll have that information and it will be it will be publicly shared what we're sharing with the state as we know for each grant. That's a given. Anyone else have any other questions? So this is, is this gonna to come to a vote in two weeks then, or should we be I'm just looking for direction. If you wanna, as a collective board, I'm not looking to her a vote. Um, if you were looking as a collective, you, or if you do not want us to, you want us to turn down the dollars, I just need to know that, because these grants are due, some of them before Christmas, break and we don't have a meeting till January whatever so I mean if, if you're if you're okay with cautiously going forward we're going to cautiously go forward I guess at some point if I if I see this is a complete overreach I could come back to you and say okay this is what they're entailing we could turn down that grant and not apply for that grant and say well, thanks but no thanks but I don't even know what to tell you at this point because they haven't released this stuff so I guess what I'm looking for is More we're going forward, we're going to take the next step, we're going to apply, we're going to get a dollar value, see what the requirements are, and then at that point we say, yeah, you're yay or nay. I don't have a problem. I mean, the worst I'm case is I'm they fine. send us the money in their state aid payment, we turn around and right. send it back <laughs> saying, thank you, but no thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm good with us going cautiously slow and checking. Mm. I just don't know that that's, is there a cautiously slow? I mean, once you sign up, you sign up. You, well, you, can, you can opt out, out in a year. Yeah. You can opt out every you year, right? You can look at it in a year. Every yeah. year and sign up for next year. Yeah. Like and we, we don't have to apply for the grant. I mean, once, yeah. There's a deadline that all of these grants say you got to commit by this date. Mm -hmm. If right. we don't submit anything, we don't get the dollars. Correct. So as we're learning where they're 
requires. What they're releasing and what they're requiring is that's our determination. But the first step is to sign up with the hub yeah. and Correct. get connection with them. And they have all of our information. And then you get. They already have all our information. Then you have proof that we've. They're just now going to get our information in this direction. They mm -hmm. already have all your kids' information. It's already going out. Everything, everything at the state level is what we require to send through pupil account. Right. Student names, addresses, how many students have IEPs, that's all sent through the pupil accounting and count date so required. So, Dr. Fry, do you know that when you aggregate it and then send it on to Lansing, are we sending names or just On the data? aggregate? No. On the no. aggregate, we're not. No, we're so just we're, sending like data. If we, if we use test scores, for example, it's you know, scale scores. It's okay. looking at average, mm -hmm. averages okay. is, what, you know, is, is what we would typically when we were able to send right. the aggregate file. Right. So right now they're getting all of our children's information except for their grades? We don't, we don't send grades. We don't send, um, we send if they're receiving Title I services. Mm -hmm. We send if they're special ed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those. They take the WIDA. If they right. take their English their language ER. learner mm -hmm. and they're at the beginning level, it tags that we have to give the WIDA test. You know, the difference here is the Michigan Department of Education already has our student data for testing scores. Right. This is just connecting it to this oh. massive database, if you will. The state already has their test scores. So it's just putting individual. It's right. putting it into yeah. the data yeah. hub. So they already have all the information. It's just not, it's just not in the data hub. Because we've opted. Well, they have it in various formats. Right. It's they not all the same. Right. Yeah, it's not. It just depends on where they're pulling it from. Oh, so they have all the information already. It's just not all in one location for them to now statistically do graphs or whatever, and make a study. They don't know whatever they want. To and do. in a very simplistic, we're telling them to take this various pods and, and put, put it, it into the data hub, so it's in one location. I guess that's the simple. The information's thing. there. They're just now saying in this area, we want it to. And if you don't do it, you're not getting your dollars. That's so technically, though, the argument of giving them the information is not, not, not even valid because not they already have it. Correct. But they don't have each individual child's right. data. They don't know what my child, what data is attached to him. They have a general. Well, they, 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 they just don't have they it all together. They, 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 they take the M step. That's yes, there. They do. But that's a test score. Yeah. It's just somewhere else, though. It's just not all. It's not, and they have their grades. It's files just in, in a different dig through 10, area. Yeah. They only have to dig through one folder instead. That's yeah. all they're trying to do. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I see there's all these little pieces. They're just trying to put it all right here in a file folder. So it's all in one spot. So they're not jumping to the yeah, very, that's a, that's a, Get it. That's a good a example. A Cliff Notes version of summarizing. You're <laughs> right. I mean, right. That's what I'm getting yeah, from this. Right. I don't know if it's. So the, I mean, they already have they already have your kid's name and their test score. Mm -hmm. Correct. The they already have that information. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Yes. The state was sending out to our third graders who was required to retain. Right. They were sending those letters out already. Now that's all changed with the third grade yeah. email, but they already had it. Just I think parents can sign in too. You look at their M step scores or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess I, we're, we're moving forward cautiously, and like I said, we're only doing exactly what we need, and I will commit to keeping the board and the community, here's what we have for this grant. For what we're and then we can kind of, if we say, no, we don't want to do that, then we you're going to give say, us that option. Then we tell them, write a letter saying we're going to decline, even though we got 23G or whatever the number is, we're going to decline it, and uh, we'll have to figure out. But our data is still going into the hub. I mean, we got to be in there to do it, so. Yes, it is. I know you're going to move forward with this something. I'm just going on the record as saying as I'm, I'm still not too sure about this, and I am planning on making some calls to try to find some more information about it. But I know you're going to do what you're going to do. What you're going to do. I didn't say what you should. No, do. I said that's what you should do. Make calls. Mm -hmm. Everybody should. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Thank you Dr. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Have a safe trip home. Yes. Thank you.
your set your bills. Good, ready? Yeah. Okay, next item on our agenda is our CTE equipment grant. Here we go. Does this grant have this piece in it? <laughs> this, this is an exciting uh, opportunity here. Um, I was going to say, now for some good news. This is Abel, as you know, is a high school principal, and I have Jeff White here, who is our, our chief EMS from uh, Richmond Lennox, who is part of our um, I don't know, EMS program we started how many? Mm. God, it's been eight years ago now? Yeah, I think so. Eight, eight years ago. So, so an awesome opportunity here and that we didn't qualify for enough money to pay for this. So, yeah, so you. thank you so much. Um, I'm going to be sharing a little bit of information about our soon to be uh, new Anamitage table. Probably mispronounced that a hundred times because I've said it a hundred times, but I somehow still misspell it and say it incorrectly. But a little bit of background on the 61C grant. Um, the 61C grant is funds specifically available for career technical education programs. Um, in the past, um, each district was able to apply for it. Um, it all went to the MISD, and then the MISD um, submitted to the state, and that would kind of get dispersed. Um, the state actually changed the way that this was funded this year and they divided it into two rounds. Um, Macomb County, um, actually Macomb and St. Clair were part of one CPID um, that is over uh, seen, overseen by Shannon Williams and we were actually, I think it was 15 districts, um, that was on a tier one level for um, applying for these funds. So um, Macomb County was awarded, I believe it was $1.15 million um, of these funds. Um, they actually went through all of the money the state, so the tier two school or tier two districts um, weren't even uh, awarded anything. Um, but basically, um, the stipulation of the grant is that 50% of the funds needed to be used on equipment to fund CTE programs with the five highest career cluster rankings. And so ultimately, um, all of CTE data, and really the purpose of CTE is really to take those in high demand um, workforce positions and skills and really make sure that they're embedded in the school. And so part of these funds needed to be spent on those programs. And so I found the opportunity. Um, I actually applied for three separate of our programs um, for funds. But this one um, was one that was funded. And so I wrote for um, an animatage table. Basically what an animatage table is, and I have a short video that you'll be able to see, is that it is a digital table, like huge, 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 big kind of imagined computer screen um, that is is real life bodies, cadavers, um, that allow students and instructors to touch, zoom in, watch videos, and literally, I kind of envision it as, um, if you remember growing up, you would go to see like the 3D body movie at a, like a planetarium where you feel like you're in uh, the human body. Um, that is what this is, and we are going to have the opportunity to have a table um, in our classroom that is showing students 3D images, um, actual beating hearts what it looks like if an organ has tumors, what it looks like for diseases, um, any sort of diagnoses that you can possibly think of, um, students will actually be able to see it in real life based on these uh, cadavers that um, they've created these scans off of. So uh, the primary goals really is to give students the real life, um, as real life, I should say, experience um, in the medical field. Um, this is something, and I kind of put the slides a little bit out of order, but a lot of our medical schools in the United States are going to using animatage tables because they're not seeing individuals necessarily want to give their body to science anymore. And so through one scan, you are able to have med students try experiments. They're able to put in, you know, a heart, um, Catheter. Yeah, stent, that's what I was thinking. I was like, I don't know if the catheter is the right word, but um, they're able to put those devices in and practice those skills on these actual tables. And so uh, basically this table is going to have student engagement. They're going to be able to touch, dissect, um, and really just do all of this through the technology, which is going to far exceed anything that they possibly would be able to do with a textbook. So they can click, they can zoom, they can do cross-section. Um, it, it really just, there's so much you can do. Um, it's kind of, it, it's hard to explain. So with that being said, um, there is a short video, and this should work once I click on it. 
to give you Every month has a story to tell. With the Nanomages Table 10, a journey through all stages of life is now possible. In its 10th iteration, the Nanomage Table takes anatomical learning to the next level with refined technology and the highest level of accuracy. Learners can now visualize real anatomical details with unparalleled resolution across the anatomage bodies, 3D cadavers derived from actual human bodies. Students and professionals can immerse themselves in the first fully interactive 3D bird simulation featuring real human anatomy brought to life. With Table 10's bird simulation, learners can visualize the anatomical transformation taking place inside a pregnant body during the different stages of labor, including cervical dilation, infant rotation and head movements, and the release of the placenta in full 3D from any angle. In Table 10, learners can also explore the impact of time and disease on an aging body. Our newest anatomage body, Hans, was a real-life individual with lung cancer who passed away at age 70. Hans offers real-world insight into various conditions, including tumors in the chest, pancreas, and liver. Table 10 not only offers a detailed look at the intricacies of human bodies, but also enables collaborative lab activities that deliver authentic learning experiences to students. The latest enhancements to our anatomage bodies include simulations such as detailed blood flow tools, including vascular growth, that simulate an intricate aroma of vessels and their branches across the entire cadaver's body. Blood particles can also be simulated for visualization. Our clinical simulation suite includes a catheter, providing the practical experience of how catheterization is performed on a real human body. Our rich database of histology allows students to analyze tissue structures. And students have the opportunity to interact with 3D scans of authentic cadaver processions, offering a true-to-life experience in cadaver study. Table 10 also elevates clinical training and care. From practicing customized surgical procedures and adapting to the unique anatomical variations of individual patients, to inspecting how the angle and rotation of an ultrasound probe may affect the field of view of internal anatomy. Exploring the inside of a human body with simulated endoscopic fly-throughs or investigating various heart rates and their corresponding ECG patterns so you can understand what they mean for your patient's cardiovascular well-being. Table 10 sets a new standard for studying anatomy and paves the way for an extensive scientific exploration into the human body that the world has never seen before. Join us on the journey today. So, um, like I said, that was, again, just a very short clip of the vast uh, variety of things that this table will be able to do for our students. Um, every time I watch it, I'm like, oh, yeah, I think about how in EMT, if they're talking about, you know, someone dislocates their shoulder, what, is, what do you need to do to get it back into place? Well, they can actually look at, and they can set the table for this is what a dislocated shoulder looks like, and then actually get to talk about how you would want to move it or how you would want to fix it. Um, same thing is true if you're talking about a heart rate, if you're talking about AEDs. There's just so many different things um, that our students will be able to do and have a deeper understanding standing of when someone is complaining about chest pains or when someone's complaining about a broken bone or you know just I just can't even begin to explain how uh, deep their understanding will be of the human body be able, by being able to look at this. So um, we're excited to bring this um, to our CTE program, specifically the EMT program. Um, we're excited to have students have this opportunity, especially if they are interested in going into whether it's nursing or even further on into the medical field. And we're really hoping that this also adds another piece. Our EMT enrollment specifically, I think it tripled over the past 
from last year to this year. Um, and I think that as we see this piece of equipment um, roll into our building, um, that will even increase the interest more. So I just wanted to share this great news. Um, and I'm really excited um, that we were uh, chosen as one of the districts to receive some of this funds um, and to have this in the hands of our students before the end of the year. So. Thank you. Jeff, would you like to say anything as part of, I mean, you've been instrumental in um, this whole program. I mean, if you ever decide to give up being a principal, <laughs> please, come, please, I don't, please come be a paramedic instructor because you literally said everything about the device that I would. It's really giving the students the ability to do, an, a, I don't know, a, a virtual autopsy. It's, a, it's really a realistic autopsy. I've been doing this um, a very long time. And I can tell you that we used to train uh, young EMTs and paramedics by giving them a recipe book. I, I, I kid it to the old Betty Crocker, you know, red and white recipe book that maybe some of you still have or certainly your, your mother's. Have. And we said, just do it this way because. What an awful way to teach. And what we learned is all they could do is follow the recipe. And when things went off the rails, which they do in our world, they didn't know how to deal with it. Having teaching tools like this really allows us to start with the basics so they understand the human body. It's like teaching a child that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And then once you teach them that, something amazing happens, and they critically think. And now you've educated them. And now you've interested them. And now they move on to become EMTs and paramedics and, and nurses. And uh, in my years with EMS, I think I'm on doctor number five. Oh. People have started with us uh, at, at the very basic level of, of EMS. So we're just, we're just thrilled to have it. It's going to be a learning curve for us, by the way. <laughs> and, and not, none of us have worked with this before. So we're going to learn to work with it as it comes. We couldn't even kind of imagine uh, having one. and so. I think when somebody offers you a eighty plus thousand dollar piece of equipment to not only train, you know, EMTs with the high school, but this is something our paramedics will come over and learn on as well within your school. Um, you know, I think it's appropriate to come say thank you. And, and so thank you for, for your for your belief, uh, because I think that's what this is really about. And thank you to the school board uh, for allowing us to, to have this piece of equipment. That you don't find these it would be interesting to, to study or, or, or learn whether there is another one of these in a high school in the country, let alone in the state. Uh, you find these in universities and medical schools. You do not find them in a local high school uh, in anywhere, let alone in Richmond, Michigan. So we're really on the cutting edge here. Thanks. I did just want to say, um, with this, yes, it's a, over it's over eighty thousand dollar piece of equipment. It does come with training, so they will come out, they will train the instructor. Um, also, um, like all uh, CTE equipment, so for example, when you have a computer lab that is used, uh, this would, you know, the primary use that computer lab is for are. CT programs when you use CT dollars for that, but you also don't want it to just sit vacant. And so there would be the opportunity, as long as it doesn't interfere with the CT class, that science classes, biology classes, anatomy classes, um, that they would be able to obviously not take the place of um, that piece of equipment and ever push out a CTE program, but um, we definitely want to make sure that we have those experiences in the hands of as many students, and even if it's a field trip of, you know, our younger students coming up from the elementary or the middle school, if they're learning, you know, age appropriately about a specific, you know, a specific thing, um, that we would provide them that opportunity. But, um, yeah, I think there's 1,500 lessons. Um, there's an online version where students can go home on their laptops and do additional work or lessons if they're, you know, if they needed help in a specific area. So um, there are very few, I think two years ago there was two in this, two high schools in the state of Michigan that I had though that had these. Um, I do know that there was multiple of us in Macomb County that did apply for this. So I don't know exactly how many were awarded, but um, we definitely are one of the few and far between that will have this. Um, 
outside of uh, medical schools and higher post-secondary universities. So it's very exciting. So I can take any questions if anyone. I don't know if I'll be able to. Oh, it didn't flip there. I don't know if I can answer them, especially the medical part, but I'll try. I'm just curious: Do all the programs come loaded on it, or are those? different level packages that you have to purchase. Yes, no, that is all, that's all there uh, for us. So again, we will, um, we'll get the training. Um, I think they come out, I can't remember if it's like a day or two. I mean, it's a, it's a lengthy training because there's just so much to it. Um, but there's, you know, there's support, there's lessons, there's, um, even when I was going through, I, I didn't realize that there was like the student component where students can access it um, from home. Um, there's a lot to it, so I think, you know, going back to what Jeff said, I think it will be a learning curve for us, it will be a learning curve for me. Um, I have seen one in person, but I've never physically used one, um, so I would like to go through the training, just, you know, worst case scenario, to make sure as many people know how to use it as possible, because we want to make sure that it's not just something where one person knows how to use it, um, that as many people as possible can, you know, share it, and hopefully once it comes in, we can maybe do a little field trip and a little show and tell. Um, in the room so yeah. but it is it is huge and I, I was even thinking I'm like okay now I got to make sure that it fits in the doorway because I know sometimes <laughs> that's the issue just it, it stands up I know they showed in the video that it lays flat but it can stand up it's like fully functional so if you literally want like the, the body to be standing up like it will stand up I mean it's and it's the size of like a person so it's real life size so but, is it like a subscription every year we have to pay to keep the so uh, my understanding is that this table 10 is the most updated version. I'm sure with any technology there are upgrades or like they said, I think Hans is the new cadaver that they released. Um, if there are upgrades or things like that, we do have our general 61A money, which is used for CTE. So we use that for our subscription software and stuff like that. So what I would anticipate is, is that if there were any updates that needed to take place over the years, um, they wouldn't be this large of a dollar amount that we would then be able to use our 61A money, which this year I think was over $150,000, we would be able to use some of that to do any sort of upgrades that we needed to. So I, I'm anticipating that there's going to be something, but there's not something where we specifically pay them every year um, that was shared with me. I think it would just be if there was, you know, upgrades or if there was a, a malfunction or something like that. What grade does your um, medical CT program start? 11th, 11th and 12th grade. Um, we have been talking about um, doing a um, an MFR, a medical first responders class for younger students. Um, so that's something that I have seen in other districts that helps prepare because students don't have to be as old to do the uh, medical first responders test. Um, and that just kind of gives them an overview of the medical field. So that is something that I know that myself and Jeff and then Sarah, the instructor, have been talking about um, implementing something for some younger students to kind of get them again more interested in the field and then hopefully boost the numbers of the EMT program as well so as of now 11th and 12th grade though so are you um, the one responsible then for writing the grants and doing all of that work so the way it worked is yes we had to it wasn't like anything lengthy or in-depth we just had to identify programs that fell under those top careers which medical public first responders uh, obviously did and then uh, we just had to put forth um, the information to Shannon Williams who oversees the CTE so that was um, something that I just filled out the sheet for and submitted to her so and then there's some obviously requirements they asked for us to speak at the board meeting obviously fill out the work fill out any paperwork and then obviously make sure that the funds are spent before June 30th so so those are kind of the things that I have to do and then obviously share with everyone the well thank you so much uh, for all of that work that's going to that's she, really she, very exciting she's underestimating yeah I, I, I kind of figured she's being a little it, it starts with having someone have a strong vision of CT yeah yeah and not only this program but all of our program and that's what has made I believe our district well and beyond others because we have we're looking at multiple aspects. My goal, and I've said it before, is every student in this district goes through a CT program in some fashion in their high school. Right. Because yeah. it, it provides a whole other world that just the, the 
core doesn't provide. Yeah, just getting the opportunity to use that makes me want to take the class. So <laughs> I mean, I think that's great. It's very exciting. Thank you. You're welcome. And I think too, just you know, kind of the same thing. Like as I was looking at, I'm like, oh, okay, that's how you know, that's what the blood or that's what the heart. You know, you hear about someone having a heart catheter or something wrong, and you're like, oh, you're you're kind of putting two and two together. And so again, I think that just. Even, I can't even imagine one or two days on that piece of equipment or piece of technology, like kids won't forget that. No. Or I would find it hard for them to forget that moving forward, so. Right. And I'll just finish with this. This continues to build our partnership with the EMS yeah. because they're gonna benefit from this too. And this is a long last So thank you for eight years ago sitting down with me and having a meeting to see, can we do this? So appreciate it. Mine, mine wasn't gonna be a question. Mine was gonna be a request for a board field trip because yeah. we have <laughs> yeah. to come in you know set up a time yeah. when it yeah. gets going along because mm -hmm. i would love to I would see, love it, to see it too yeah it will it will be exciting so <laughs> yeah. thank, thank, you. You. thank you thank you can i jump going next one because we have another yeah. celebration yeah. here tonight which is the next one um the proposal, the proposal. um we have an opportunity miss oh. morella um <coughs> Ms. Shack, um Ms. Ryan, how are you? I don't know if she's still here. Oh, there she is. We have an opportunity to celebrate a particular student who has made a remarkable accomplishment and, and support the student. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys to start. And um, my request is to support this. So. Um, I'm Molly Shack. I am the instrumental music teacher here at Richmond. Um, and we have a student, Claire Reinhardt, and she made it from her basketball game. Come on up here, Claire. Uh, Come on. Just in time. Come on, I don't. Um, it's okay. Come on up. <laughs> like these sneakers. Um, and I'm really proud of Claire. She works really hard at um, learning her instrument and the, the clarinet. And um, she came to us from Memphis a couple of years ago and just has thrived here. She's played, um, she's in eighth grade now, but even as a seventh grader, she's played with the high school ensemble and we play with the Oakland Youth Symphony, right? Um, on her own time, being in private lessons. Well, this year, it was over the summer, and um, I thought the Allstate Band, this is a great opportunity for Claire. So the Allstate Band um, started in two, about 2005, 2006 um, on behalf of the Michigan Music Conference, which is held in Grand Rapids every January. And students can audition, it's a blind audition, so what Claire had to do is she had to learn uh, an etude, a piece of music, and um, memorize some scales and play it, uh, recorded it, got it submitted. Um, they don't attach, uh, I was there through the process, uh, they don't attach her name or face to her recording. Um, it's sent blind to a judging panel and they rank all the students. Um, so about, there's four ensembles that play in Grand Rapids, um, two orchestras and two bands, middle school and high school. Um, about 4,000 or 2,000 students audition for these four groups. Um, there was 94 middle school clarinet players who auditioned for 20 spots. Um, Claire got placed in the ensemble, which is awesome. This is the first student who, you know, from Richmond that has made it this far. So it's an amazing accomplishment. But there's more. <laughs> <laughs> so out of the 20, so she's in like, let's say the top 20%, right? Okay. Um, she's ranked first in her section. Wow. And you, you talk about like that the CTE table, like being like here in Richmond. You keep talking about like here in Richmond. Rich, I mean, this is yes, you're in Richmond. Like you know, the, we don't have a university accessible like private lesson teachers like you did. Let's say you live in Rochester, you have Oakland, mm -hmm. or um, if you lived in Washington County, you have that and stuff. So it's like this pool of teachers that we have here. You know, especially as you get farther and farther north. Um, so this is just amazing and I'm really proud of Claire and it's her this is her work and her um, you know her passion and I just hope that you know we can encourage this by supporting her um, as she goes in January so. so we're really obviously very proud of Claire this is a pretty prestigious honor um, not only for Claire but for Mr. Shack for our middle school and for our school district. It is, this is outstanding. And um, we couldn't be more proud of Claire. And I don't know if any of you, I know a few of you were at the band concert last week, but watching Claire play is just a joy in and of itself. She is so animated. And when she played with the high schoolers, at first it took me a minute, I'm like, gosh, that, 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 looks, like, that looks like Claire. I'm like, oh my gosh, that is Claire. She's playing with the high schoolers. And I didn't even know that until I saw her on stage. 
and just watching how excited she is to play her instrument is, is, is just exciting for us to watch as the people who are in the audience. So we are just asking the board if um, we could get some financial help for, um, for Claire and for um, her mom who's going to be attending with her um, and Mrs. Shack. Um, we, as broken down um, by what the information is in the board packet because we know how important these things are and any help that we can offer families to be able to access these, access these types of opportunities, um, we are certainly greatly appreciative of the board we consider. So. It, it is a lot like um, this opportunity is if, uh, like I ran cross country in high school and I, we qualify for states as a team, but like if you went to states as an individual, this is what she's doing. So she's going as an individual to a state level event. This is not District 16 Honors Band. It's not District 16 Soul and Ensemble State. I mean, this is like, and it's not like we made it to State Band Festival. This is the top state level with the top kids across the state of Michigan. Um, and uh, and it's no guarantee that it'll happen year after year, just like a sporting event, right? You know, we know that and nothing is guaranteed. So um, just to, I think, support the arts, support, um, these students who are going above and beyond here in Richmond um, would be just an amazing, uh, amazing thing to 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 be part of for this year. So, so. so in the packet later tonight is a recommendation to approve this. It would be treated as a state tournament. So we would take the amount that allocated to help support Claire get to this point. And then obviously um, Mrs. Shack would come out of the professional development fund for her to support her. So. Does Claire want to say anything? I'm just going to ask. <laughs> 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 Got to put her on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything you want to say? Or just tell me what to say. We're excited too. Yes. Very excited for you. It's really cool. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so a former Claire and a player of seven years. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> I've been top uh, clarinet player for 10 years. Uh, <laughs> and I bet neither one of them did what nope. you did. Yeah. No. <laughs> so look at that. Claire. No, so. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll just end with this. And I know this is about recognizing Claire and where she's going, but um, if you haven't had a chance to hear a band under Mrs. Shack, I mean, the concert the other night oh. was unbelievable. It was. And it always is. And, and, it, and it's just amazing what Mrs. Shack does every year to get students who basically have no music start of an instrument to where she takes them. It's just, it's remarkable. So thank you very much for what you do. Thank you. Your past thank you. Thank you. And she'd be playing Saturday morning at 8 a.m. If anybody's available, Grand Rapids, I know. <laughs> okay, next item on our agenda is our instructional spotlight. Ms. Staples. are our instructional coaches in our district. We have Ms. Jessica Schleykuber and Ms. Jamie Clawson here. And I'm gonna begin and then I'm gonna pass it on to them. And just see what's over here. <laughs> we got this weird little thing. Right. Um, so <laughs> you obviously have your shirts. You have your Thank lovely you. porcelain ducks. Um, <laughs> we are launching duck days and it is going to be so much fun. So um, when I first thought about a supplemental program that would increase literacy achievement levels, but keep reading personalized and authentic, um, Accelerated Reader was one of the front runners of programs that I kept coming back to. Our goal with launching AR and Duck Days is to create a culture of reading, an environment where reading is championed, valued, respected, and encouraged. At its heart, AR is a program that helps students and their families put reading into action. Here is some lovely data, so I can't be up here without talking about it. And yes, I did create this little blue double duck. It's lovely. <laughs> and somebody like, made it felt. So I'm like, oh my gosh, somebody has to like make all those. 
Um, <laughs> so you can see here, students using Accelerated Reader grew significantly more than students not using the program. The better Accelerated Reader was implemented, the more kids grew. Studies also showed that students who reached reading targets with AR were nearly twice as likely to be college and career ready by the time that they exited. Um, it also showed, I didn't want to throw all sorts of data in here, but also students that are economically disadvantaged, students that are EL, students that are Title I, they even grew even more. This is just the basic uh, baseline of just all student populations, but it's very important to recognize the students that were struggling readers actually showed significant gains using AR as well. So this is just a little bit about how it works. It creates um, personalized goals to help students stay focused on factors that matter most for reading growth and help monitor their progress and provide feedback that keep learners on track. Individual reading recommendations uses student interests and reading levels to suggest the just right titles or students can select from over nearly quarter million titles available. Um, just reading transforms into high quality reading practice that fuels growth, reading quizzes monitor comprehension, while literacy skills and vocabulary quizzes extend student learning and build skills mastery. Detailed reports are provided to the instructor to help provide insights, be able to do conferencing with students, and be able to help them reach their goals. So a little bit about how it works. Pretty simple, and I love this premise that incorporates student choice and voice when they are selecting titles. We know that we can't have a reading program that um, the books are sometimes prescribed or dictated to us. We want students to be able to choose the titles that speak to them if they're really interested. Um, it motivates students. Um, each level get a little prompt that they get to choose whether they want Ours is the rocket ship. Well, you know, kids love that. Um, but there's like a forest that they get to choose from or just a plain chart. And our kids all voted for the rocket ship, even the older kids that you would think they just want the plain chart. Oh, no. They're like, you give me that rocket. Yeah, the rock, they like, because like the rocket like, is heading towards the planet. And basically, if they see their point goal, it goes beyond the planet. And then they're like in a purple outer space. And so like, I mean, even like the second grade teachers chose to go the rocket and like, people said to like the upper L, or I should say like the seventh and eighth graders, I um, didn't want just the plain line. So we are launching AR kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, it allows them to read a book and take a quiz. Did you understand what you read? Obviously for the younger kiddos, it's one or two questions. Could, who was the main character? Um, another thing to recognize is, uh, specifically about this program is we have a large variety of learners However the book is read is how they will take the quiz. That is essential when you think about how is a first grader going to just read this novel and pop on and take a quiz? Well, if it's read to them during special time or as a read aloud after lunch, um, then it's read to them on the quiz. So however it is read to them. So if they are reading with a buddy, they get to take the quiz with a buddy. So it mirrors their ability level to be able to do that. It's all personalized, so it takes into effect how long students are reading to self, and it's like a formula, what their current Lexile or DRA number is, and it matches them with a goal. So each student has their own personalized goal that they are trying to meet. So as you look at this with the little rocket ship, every kid's got their own goal that no one else is aware of. They just know that they've got to meet their goals and their points. Before they even take a quiz, too, to be honest with you, they have to have that talk with the teacher, too. And every teacher has to add, like, a password in order for, like, a student to take a quiz. So basically, students can't just, like, like re recall books of their past and just take random quizzes yeah. in hopes yeah. to just get the amount of points. <laughs> that's yeah. not the amount of points. That's not the I've ever read. Right. They did. They did. One of the eighth graders were like, hey, I read all these books. Can I just get these points? And that's why it's very personalized, too. And it's really important to have those teacher talks. And like the stable said, mm -hmm. too, there's quizzes. Um, a lot of the quizzes are like three to five to ten questions. Mm -hmm. We actually they have some high level readers. We do. Questioning quizzes. So, yeah. So you would think that our, um, it was so funny too, because originally I just was thinking about launching this K-5, and it was funny because I met with the middle school teachers, and they were like, oh, wait a minute. 
So I'm like, well, we want to do it too. And it was funny because I was doing a inferencing lesson play last week with the seventh and eighth grade class, and they were all excited. I can't wait for the for the dot day, like seventh and eighth graders. I was like, all right, we've got this. <laughs> Um, does anybody have a question of just a, really briefly on just like little, how it works or making goals? It's all personalized. You get to read. You get to make your points. Um, we do set the bar at 85%. Um, so they have to, you know, if they can't show low comprehension, they won't give them the, the quizzes. Um, you cannot quiz at home. That is a feature that we don't allow. Um, but there is a home connect portion. Uh, they're able to read at home, which is part of the joy, right? You're, reading at home and then you get to take your AR quiz here at school where we can monitor to make sure that it's not the parent who's um, quizzing on how well that they've read <laughs> something or maybe helping a little bit. And Friday or and or today too, basically a note, two notes at home. Like basically so to the parents and families so that they knew how to access the program and basically what level their students were currently reading at, what the goal expectation was. Now we do have the updates every five weeks. That's what it's more or less based off based off our breaks and things like that. So it's accommodated sometimes. Um, so their goals will change or update for the amount of days they're present in school. Because again, like even though we encourage reading at home, um, the formula too, part of the formula for success too, is that once the student completes reading a book, that they take the quiz within 24, 24 hours. hours. So, so it's that so will be the best the comprehension, mm -hmm. like wealth of knowledge too. This too, this is my excitement because like I'm more a math person, oh. but like crosses over a little bit. So the formula for success, so I had the opportunity to go into um, a lot of seventh and eighth grade classes and the special education classes and talk to the students about this formula for success. So basically we've already had like SSR, which was like silent reading time built into like our K-8 programs, where the students were reading on average for 20 minutes a day. So like this is like the mathematical calculation. So basically if students are reading for 20 minutes a day and scoring like an eight, or sorry, within their zone, their zone of proximity to is basically like books that aren't too easy, but books that aren't challenging. So maybe like they're reading a book that's a little bit more challenging, but it's getting to be like tiresome and when they're done, they want to read like a little bit lighter book, mm -hmm. so they can. Their zone of proximity to is based off again Lexile or their DRA scores based off of again like what grade level they're in. And then we're looking for an 85% accuracy like on the comprehension assessment, so like on the quizzes. Um, if you do all of that, then you should basically show double your growth as a reader. Um, for the five, for the three question and five question quizzes, they have to pass with a 60% um, as far as like a passing score to get any amount of points. If they're taking a 10 question quiz, they have to pass with 70% or higher. If they fall below the 70 point or 70 percentage, then they're not getting any points at all. The same with the three and five question quizzes. If they fall below 60%, they're not getting any points at all. However, the teacher can have the student retake the quiz and or they could delete the quiz and then encourage the student to go back. So really teacher talks, teacher student talks are like the key to the making this program successful. And basic conferencing, hey, I noticed that you didn't do well in this quiz. Are we selecting the right um, level titles? How can I help you with this? Or you're just there. Um, and so really just trying to have more of those discussions around literature. Any questions so far? Next is the exciting part. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so this is what the student progress tracker looks like. The very first one is um, for K2, uh, Greenwood Glen, and that actually uh, the kindergarten and first graders, they're all using the rocket ship because the teachers kind of they modeled it the very first week we launched mm -hmm. it, so Thanksgiving week and the week after, we had made up a student, Randy, who, and then the teachers had access. And so what, we, what they were able to do is read stories and take quizzes with the class, as a whole class. And the kids won it, a lot, all of them actually, kinder and first, <laughs> second, and they all choose the rocket ship. Um, so this is what the kids see. Okay, so they, they read a book, they go take a quiz, and it's immediate feedback. They watch, and then their rocket ship just travels. Oh, cool. It's really yeah. cool, and it was the sweetest little thing, too. I was with kindergarten, and just watching. I, it's so small. They know it's reading, right? What a but confidence booster. I can really talk. This, these <laughs> little <laughs> yeah. And then it gets, even, like, here, it gets even better. Then they hit continue, and the rocket ship goes beyond the planet. And so it's going off into the universe, and it's going somewhere new. And so now they need a new goal. Well, what's the new goal? Where is the rocket ship going? So then when the teacher sets the new goal and they get to log in, it's just it's new and refreshing and engaging. It really is. 
even the older fourth fifth, you know, my daughter's a fifth grader, same thing. She's coming home to talk, this book is, mom, this is two AR points, can you believe it? <laughs> um, like, that's awesome. So, and then the bottom is just the example of the six eight, which you see, it's it's just plain. So, and like when I went into a class too, and like I was modeling, like just said to like, once they hit the planet, like, or even saw like the rocket move, and it kind of moved significantly, like when the teacher did a read out loud, like the kids were asking the teacher, like if they could do like another read out loud as a class because they just felt the success too. So I feel like the atmosphere in the buildings right now is just like excitement or like more people are talking books. So good. Yeah. We're gonna let you keep looking. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is this one right? Mm -hmm. um, so like this is actually what the, te the teacher views. So there are, there, there's probably two dozen different reports that the teacher is able to pull, but this is the general. So. Um, in the first column there is the overall comprehension, so if the kids are taking five, so it just kind of tracks where they are. Um, even if they don't pass a quiz or get any points, actually not pass, but if they pass with a 60 and didn't get any points, it's still averaged in. But it gives the teacher the opportunity to look at, so if you look on the very top line, review range. Um, so then that, uh, that allows the teacher right away to say, you know what, maybe I need to have a conversation really quickly. Next time we go to check out a book from the classroom library or media center, let's just look together. Let's look at the words and the pictures and the level together. You still want them picking good fit books, but books they're interested in too, and sometimes that's challenging mm -hmm. because they want, you know, they look at the cover and, you know what I mean? And they look so, at their friends and what yeah. they're reading. So I think having a good balance and having those conversations is important, and then right down the middle is the points there. So you see what the goal is, 2.6, their goal is exceeded. Um, so then that makes duck days pretty simple. So Friday when we're going around and um, with the ducks, with the wagon of ducks, the teacher can pull this right up and then just the students are call the student names and that's that. And it helps too because there were some of those students that were trying to read or like take quizzes just to get those points. So like if you see that like the student is not hitting that comprehension level or within like like 19% is within their range too. So they might have like read or used books as a source from prior to like today's day too. Mm -hmm. So prior to this grade level. <laughs> Cheat. So we're we're all in this together. Um, everybody, you all have your duck day shirts. Um, Title one, um, special education, parapros. We're all, it it takes everyone to to do this. So everybody's aware of duck days. Um, if the art teacher is reading a book at uh, you know in her class, they can take an AR quiz on it. So really embracing that literature doesn't just happen in one classroom with one teacher. It's everyone. We're all reading. We're all readers. This is what we're all about. I think for years everybody thought like reading always had to do with the ELA teacher. We want to make sure that's not the case. So everybody's reading. And like I said, there's the home connection. Um, parent letters went out so that they're able to log in and see what their children are reading. Um, they're able to see where they are in their quizzes, um, and they're able to see the progress that the students are making on the rocket ships. And both of our media center techs, um, mm -hmm. both at the elementary and at the middle school, are going through, um, like they took it upon themselves to start labeling the books, like with the levels and with like the points and things like that. So they're even having conversations with the students too. Mm -hmm. So. I have a question. Yeah. Oh, is it this one? Oh, <laughs> that, that wasn't right. <laughs> now you sure. sure. No, so I'm sure I'm not the only one. Wait, when I got my paper home, it yeah. just had like the typed information, but that whole bottom that was supposed to be filled out is completely blank. So like, I have no information for Jackson, but like, I'm sure there's other students who got a blank form too. Is that right. normal? So. It's actually, it's okay, yes and no. I mean, if it wasn't filled out, but what's great is when you log in, so his Jackson's login information for the parent, for like parent portals, the parent connect, oh, sorry, the yeah. home mm -hmm. connect, you, you'll actually, once you log in, you will see his goal points and where he is in there. Okay. So his little level, it'll say, his, his range, it'll say, you know, 1.0 to 1.5 would be an example. Right. So anything that was written on that paper, you will be able to view on. Okay. Some so. teachers were concerned that the paper might get lost too, and then have the student's name on it and their reading or scores and expectations. Yeah. So, like, like, we did get mixed emotions about like putting that out in that way. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Good question. Okay. 
Okay. Why all the ducks? <laughs> what is a duck day? Um, because it's fun. <laughs> because it's fun. Um, and there is absolutely a place for fun and joy in schools, especially when it comes to trying to create a culture of readers and, and having that reading culture. Um, the duck is a symbol, okay? Each child, regardless of reading abilities, attitudes about reading, um, special needs, prior experiences, under that water, all their little legs are just frantically paddling away. Um, and they're all working at their own goals. They're only in competition with themselves to try to be a better reader than they were. They're not being compared to the person they're sitting next to or the, the classroom next door or the grade next door. They're literally all part of this culture that we're creating saying we can all win we can all get ducks I'm rooting for you too and so that's kind of what it's about um, we're all in this together we're all excited for each student to meet their reading goals and we are all committed to creating a fun culture of reading and as unique as the goals are within the program for each and every individual too the ducks are not just all your basic yellow ducks too so like the ducks, if you saw the wagon, like the ducks have personality too. So just like the program, the ducks are unique too. And the so, students will get the choice to pick which duck they like. My, my, so I got wagons for the principals and um, I filled them up with, with rubber ducks. And the principals are gonna walk around. I got them earrings too. So just to you know, ease the, <laughs> here you go. Um, uh, the kids that make their, their AR points Principal's the one, and possibly Mr. Knight, not saying he bought a gigantic little of that costume, but awesome. maybe he did. But um, <laughs> be walking around to get students their, their AR points and excited for duck days. Um, and so they were created, and you have um, a piece of paper that tells you when to wear your um, duck shirts and stuff. Those are official duck days. They are centered around where our report cards in, so obviously you can use this as their overall lifestyle and overall comprehension. If, your, you know, and your um, standards, um, as well as a center point, so that way it's not so far away, so really try to make it kind of monthly, so relevant, but not too excessive. And, um, of course, um, I'll let you read this, I don't want to, um, but here are some voices from teachers that are using the program from all different levels. I have a second grade, fifth grade, and a sixth or eight ELA teacher talk about their experiences with it so far. It, it's teacher like discretion. If she if they feel that this accurately reflects an overall comprehension score, they could choose to use it. Um, but this is just a supplemental program to help with reading. So if they want to grade it, they can. But just like all programs. So you know our duck days? And voices from students. What do they think about this? Once again, I have voices from second grade, fifth grade, um, and six, eight, so. And I actually even had a, like, a student <laughs> that know. came up to me in an eighth grader in the hall the other day, and like literally we're just walking and passing, and he's like, this is awesome, like, I reached my goal. So like, I mean, it's just like conversations, and like, you know, reading, like, I mean, I've worked with him in different capacities, and like, sometimes he struggled, and now he's excited about reading, so. And everybody's talking ducks, like at least in the <laughs> <laughs> So they get it, so they get a duck every time they reach a goal. They, and they read earn their a duck. AR points, the principal's gonna walk around with a rubber duck, they get a rubber duck of their choice. And that so but is that only on these days? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Got it. On those days. Like they the have so they may day. collect five ducks on this day. No. No, they, no. they earn they one duck that day. Oh, they just get one duck. One duck, and then they have to make their AR points for and the following duck day. I got, day. I got it. Got four it. weeks to make their goal. I got it. Yep, and the goal is going to just keep increasing. And the points are individualized based on the grade level, too. So all students have like different points that they're working towards. Too. Awesome. And if they reach it too soon, too, that's when the teacher really should be having talks with the student mm -hmm. to adjust like, like that grade level. Oh, OK. Cool. So yeah. it might not be a true indicator from the lexile and for the DRA level. So. Very cool. 
Well, this is a future thought, but is there is this somehow going to be incorporated in March's reading month somehow? Oh, or? absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's That's a it's a duck day. <laughs> duck day in March. Yeah, no, we we absolutely need to. I keep trying to come up with like a culminating like idea. We can think yeah. of like maybe like the Willy Wonka, like the golden duck at the end if you've met <laughs> all your duck days or something. But I'm open to suggestions for the ending. Because oh, I know some yeah. of us do, or all of us go in and read. Yeah, we so yeah. is there anything we, that we can wear our duck Yeah, yeah. Duck I mean, 100%. Well, just just like 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 our do it up my deals. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> no pressure, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we have these bulletin boards, too, that like are almost ready to be put up, and we're going to change the saying on them, and they're like, in the main traffic pattern, like or I guess traffic way at the middle school, and then at Lee also. So they're going to be like duck bulletin boards. And then we might be calling on you to do some reading so that we can make it fun and interesting for the students so that if they wanted to hear a story, so you might want to pull out your favorite story because that's coming down the pipeline too. <laughs> <laughs> if you came up with duck If you had a good deal on ducks, let us know. Are you just <laughs> that? No, I'm not. I am. You know me, I'm just kind of My dash has got them all lined up. I have to earn my duck. Right. Yeah. I did make the blue nibble duck. I was like very proud of myself. I was like, I need to get the right oh horns. And, yeah. Very good. Cool. Oh, very good. Any good. other questions? Can you share how the high school staff uses ducks to support each other? So, okay, so this did trickle also. I'm sure Connor knows because I gave you some ducks too and you're already probably you're familiar with what they are. Um, at the high school, the staff actually has a, they created a verb, it's called ducking, and you've been ducked. And you, these little porcelain ducks get put in your mailbox, in your classroom, all over like Miss Jar's Jeep out the parking lot um, and they you get ducked and it's just like a way of being like hey I acknowledge you I I'm just giving this to you and it's just honestly didn't you just smile when you see a little duck <laughs> did you just smile I mean that's kind of the point so they actually go through and they, they duck each other they put ducks everywhere and oh they pass it to each other and it's just a thing like you know, who knew? It was like the Jeep thing. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. So, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Yeah. because the Jeep thing always has a little message of, like, usually, of um, hope you have a good day. Okay. Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. a positive thing usually mm -hmm. if and, you get them on your Jeep. And, and that is the intent yes. with the high school, just yeah. building that mm -hmm. in terms of recognizing and trying to put a smile yeah. on someone's face. So, when I have left, it usually is with a little note. So there was some. You know, it's just that it's something good. I think everyone does something different, but I do think sometimes there's little notes of encouragement too. Good. Very nice. Any, anybody else? I just wanted to say thank you. My daughter came home. Super excited about the program. I didn't realize, I kind of put it together later, that it was the duck days. She was uh -huh. just really having fun with the accelerated reading. Yeah. And really enjoyed the program since so she's in third shirt. grade. Oh, so. it's oh I know. She's, she's got a shirt. Research, she's like, what is happening? I know. And it's five <laughs> days from now, so I know. Maybe so, I'll yep. have urge her to get back on it if she hasn't met her goal yet. Yep. The first duck day is coming up, so we're all very, very excited. Like I said, to earrings all. and shirts and... <laughs> Well, Give us a video. Shoot us a video. So feel <laughs> free to join in the fun as, yeah. as to the extent yeah. that you want to, and you know, come <laughs> join us. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. Next item on our agenda is our board policy updates. Mr. Walmsley. Okay. Um, prior to the legislators adjourning for the holiday season and, and legislative session, there were several laws that were passed that either changed the Michigan Employment Relations Act, changed the school aid, um, the state school aid act or the revised school code, and even the teacher tenure act. So there are 11 policies that um, are required to be adjusted to be in compliance with the new laws that will either take effect very soon, or some do not take effect until January, or excuse me, July 1st of 24. So tonight I'm going to go over and summarize the changes in our policies, and then this will come back to you in January for approval of these policies. Um, and this is important because a lot of these policies, um, as contracts are expiring, or we're getting noticed by various union groups that they're requesting to negotiate things that 
were previously prohibited subjects of bargaining that are now required bargaining subjects. Um, so I will go through each one. If you have any questions, again, feel free to um, ask and interject. The first policy is 4108, which is union activities and representations. This policy identifies what the district will not engage in, and some of this is stuff regarding to the, the policy. The change here is um, that the law now changes that union dues, public school of resources, can be used to collect union dues. All of this is negotiated, so um, uh, we know with some of our bargaining units that are currently bargaining, this has now been brought to the table, and so this will have to be agreed upon language. The language that's in uh, highlighted, um, I am recommending, it is optional, but it's not required, but I'm recommending that the board approve that. Basically what it's saying is that unless the bargaining agreement prohibits it, again, this has to be negotiated, that allows the district to um, uh, charge a fee to collect dues. Um, again, that would have to be negotiated um, in that process. So um, that's the first one. 4207 um, basically removes the ability to hire third party um, services. If you recall, really for several years, the, the state incentivized third party contracting and would give you 50 extra dollars, et cetera. Um, this removes that um, ability. This really doesn't affect us because we have brought everything back in-house since then. Um, but it just would allow us that, that we would be in compliance with the current law regarding third party contracting. Uh, policy 4402 is dash R. This is a replacement policy and it used to be called assignment and transfer. It's now called placement. This policy would not go into effect until July 1 of 2024. But it basically codifies how we are placing individuals based on um, certifications as well as collective bargaining agreements um, that we would have to be that has to be negotiated. There's a lot of language in there. Um, again, just um, looking at the things that we consider in that. Again, there, this is the conversation that I'm anticipating that those bargaining units that this affects, we will be having a conversation regarding how this looks in their contract. Policy 4403 also is a replacement policy. This is called the performance evaluation. Um, this basically identifies that based on the statutory language that's currently in the revised school code of 1249, um, all the, it's basically reiterating the, the law that we are in compliance. Again, this is another one that would have to be negotiated in terms of the implementation of this policy regarding the criteria and the uh, uh, ratings. Um, the one that I will be um, recommending, and I, I left it here if you look at number seven, it gives you a choice whether you want to do it biannually or triannually. This is basically the, the teachers that receive highly effective um, on the, or effective on the most three consecutive year ratings. You don't have to do them every year. Um, my recommendation to the board would be biannually, um, that they are um, every other year evaluations. Um, you may ask why biannually. Bi Populations of students change, and sometimes you have different kids coming through that are more challenging, and um, we just want to make sure we've got the best teachers in front of them um, and effectively using the strategies for those kids. So that's my recommendation would be biannually, uh, year-end evaluations for those. The, the law actually changes no longer the four categories, it's three. But basically, the highly effective and effective are the top two, which would be the, um, I believe it's effective on the new um, um, grading system. So, again, a lot of the other components are right from the law. We have to use a tool that's approved by the MBE. Um, it also talks about non teachers, non teaching professionals that are not subject to the Teacher Tenure Act. This would be your social workers, um, speech paths, et cetera. Again, all of that is um, has to be negotiated. 
Uh, so this is just putting the policy to put the framework in to negotiate. Policy 4404, which is performance-based base compensation. This was specifically previously for teachers. It just goes to uh, changing it to performance-based compensation, which allows the superintendent could implement a performance base. The previous law required us to have a perf uh, performance-based compensation. Ours was a formula. If you had a highly effective, based on a pot of dollars, we, we gave compensation highly, more compensation to uh, individuals with highly effective over effective. If you were minimally or ineffective, there was not a performance compensation received. Um, this just allows us to still implement if we cho choose to, but it's not a requirement of Section 1250 of the um, Revised School Code. Policy 4405, which uh, does not go into effect until July 1st, 2024. This is a replacement policy. So you see the previous policies all stricken out. And it, um, at the end of it is the new policy, which is uh, how we reduce uh, and recall um, professional staff, et cetera, looking at the approved budget and, and how that goes about. Um, there are some specifics that would have to be negotiated with the individual groups, um, but this gives you the framework of being in compliance with the new law on uh, what used to be a prohibited subject. Um, there is letter B in this section is an option. Um, you can see there is an option one and there is an option two. My recommendation is to use option one um, which is what our current practice is. When all things of the evaluation have been equal, we have looked at seniority. Um, option two, um, just by looking at it, doesn't lead you down that road. Um, I believe it would be in our best interest to continue following what, what, and we haven't had to, I can't tell you the last time we reduced staff and had to actually use it, but it's always been a practice that if everything's equal on the evaluation, then we'll look at years of service in the district. 4407, discipline used to be a prohibited subject of bargaining. Um, again, it is no longer, so the process for dealing with discipline is negotiated, but this establishes the framework. Um, for how we, um, which is the practice that we currently have been using. Forty-four oh eight is termination. Again, this uh, this identifies the uh, how someone would be terminating. Again, it's it's not inconsistent with our current practice. There's a process, uh, a due process that we follow. Documentation talks about probationary teachers. Uh, which, again, at, at the recommendation of the of the board, can be terminated with advance notice, et cetera. Talks about non-teaching professionals. Um, this talks about the probationary period. Uh, we currently have a five-year probationary period, so this is the recommendation to keep it as a five-year. So is that the one where it says choose one or two, but yes, two is blocked in out? Yes, in letter so C. Saying, okay. Yes. And this is for non-teaching professionals, because you have to remember we have got, got teachers that fall under the Teacher Tenure Act, which are, are primarily the majority of the teachers, and there are some that do not fall under the Teacher Tenure Act that we're dealing with. And you also have other professionals, could be some administrators and so forth, that do not fall under the Teacher Tenure Act. 4409 is a replacement policy. This is the non-renewal of a certificate. This goes into effect July 1 of 2024. Again, you can see um, it just defines the non-renewal probationary. It gets consistent with the five-year probationary piece that was talked about in the previous policy. Um, teachers who had tenure in a previous district are subject to a two-year probationary unless this board acts to um, reduce the probationary period, but typically we keep them on a two-year probation, um, et cetera. 
4503 is a replacement policy. This is the performance evaluation. This will go into effect July 1, 2024. Our current evaluation uh, is in place this year, but beginning next year it changes. So we will be looking at, um, again, some of this stuff is negotiated in that evaluation. So we have to, we have to sit down and meet with the uh, appropriate groups, but this builds the framework of how we're um, what we have to have in the evaluation and the ratings. Is there one out there, Brian? Right Pardon? Now? Is there one out there right now of an evaluation that fits this recommendation? Um, we still have to use one of the approved by the state. So our current one is one of the approved ones okay. by the state. But um, okay. there are some components like the student growth you may have read in the paper recently. Right. That was just reduced down to um, those 25 percent now rather than 40 percent, 20 percent, excuse me. Um, so what that data is on where it used to be 50 percent of the 40 percent had to be meat testing or I, I'm dating myself, sorry, M-step testing. Um, now that's a negotiate on terms of what that data is going to be used. So again, those are all from section 1249 in the um, Revised school code. 440, excuse me, 4504 talks about performance compensation for administrators and supervisors. This is consistent with the teaching one that just says we can implement it. It's not required by law anymore. Um, in the past, administrators and teachers, based on their final evaluation, received the compensation to be in compliance with the law. Um, it's no longer required, um, but it allows us if we want to include that or, or continuing. Questions? So is the idea in January, the one that you said, I'm looking for that option, if nobody tells you anything different, you'll come back with those options? And I will come well. back with those options, yes, in the policy. Okay. And some of these, like I said, you'll approve, but they won't take effect until July 1 of 24 when the law requires them to be. That some have to be negotiated. Um, the policy doesn't have to be negotiated. Some of the context yes. of what's in the current contract, which we used to be prohibited subject, would okay. have to be um, okay. a conversation. Okay. Good. Anyone else have any questions? Okay. Next item on our agenda is our blue double raids. I'm going to start with Margaret. Okay. Um, I have a few. Uh, first, I'm going to go back to the city Christmas parade and just wanted to thank our transportation department, <clears throat> Terry and Terry Askew and Jennifer Rinke, who are the bus drivers that got the bus all decorated and down Main Street we went. And Brian was there, Cynthia was there, Ann Gallagher, Heidi Mangooney, uh, and myself. It was very fun, So and uh, the bus looked great. Um, my other rave is um, Brian had sent out an email to us about an incident that happened at the wrestling um, meet on Saturday and a couple of people brought it up to me that uh, Kelly jumped right in to help the person that had their medical situation and um, I just thought it's something to recognize because not everybody will jump up and do that when they have a medical background to help sometimes they stay back so um, it was recognized by people that were there what you did so thank you for that uh, Saturday night was the annual Sandy's Kids fundraiser that we have at the Cook Hotel and we raised three thousand three hundred dollars Saturday night um, very cool very exciting it helps our needy students and their families a um, lot of staff were there, uh, Sandy and Deb and Candace came, Cynthia and her husband, of course, Brian's there. Um, and I just always like to thank Dave and Cheryl Goslin, who own the Cook Hotel, that they open it up, let us come in, hold our fundraiser, and it's just uh, just really a cool event. So thank you. Um, it was a success again. Um, and then on Saturday, um, our eSports team won uh, the state championship and um, I was able to watch it with my sister on her TV at her house and I'm telling you, I look forward, I know we're gonna ask them to come in January and, and honor them, but holy smokes was that fun. 
I mean, I, um, my niece and nephew were laughing because they said I was acting like I was at a football game as I'm yelling at these kids and I learned, you know, uh, a golden mushroom, I learned a banana peel, what they did, and an oil spill, and holy smokes, it, it, was, it was great. What's that? No, it was cool. And I don't know any, I don't, I've never played those video games or anything, but my God, that was great. And so I just want to uh, recognize the kids on the team, Talon Holdwick, Ethan DeLang, Roland LaGruth, and Lucas Van Denneville. Uh, the coaches Hunter Hill and the teachers Kathy Campo, um, and I just just real quick because I'll go into more of it when we when we honor them. But I love Kathy Campo's statement to my sister was, "I almost died when we had to do a tiebreaker to win I that know. thing," and I you know and it just made me laugh. I was like, "Oh my gosh!" So it was the announcers were really into it and fun. It it was really cool. So great job those kids and and the coach and. And Kathy, and thank you, Renee, for getting that program at the high school. That's it. Thank you. Um, Danielle? Um, so I have been, the last couple of weeks, I've been hanging out in kindergarten classrooms holding these centers. Um, and so that's, that's been an adventure. Um, but I have to give kudos to those kindergarten teachers because holy cow, so they deserve a recognition of their own. Um, with the classroom management, it's like herding cats. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's nuts. Um, and then this week, all week, I'm helping with the Santa shop at the elementary. Um, and today, I helped from 11 to 1 um, before I tag team to over to the kindergartners. Um, and it was a ton of fun. And they had some of the high schoolers there. And I actually come to find out after the fact, one of them was Angela's son, Joe, um, was there helping out. I guess Joe had signed up for the morning session and not the afternoon session, but they came back for the afternoon and I happened to be there. And like, I just heard somebody talking and I would have sworn it was a parent or a teacher and I turned and it was Joe sitting down with these kids. All right, let's sit down and take a look at your totals. And it was, he was doing an awesome job. I told Angela, I said it felt like he was like a seasoned teacher or a parent. I really thought it was and then I turned and saw that it was one of the high schoolers. Um, so I think it was really great to see those high schoolers get in there and help the kids out and then want to come back for more even though they weren't signed up for another time frame. So um, kudos to those high schoolers that were there this morning too. <laughs> Candace? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I just wanted to say um, kudos to Mrs. Shack and um, her performance with the band concert on Tuesday and Thursday. It was by far the best, I have to say, collaboration. And um, everything just, I, I was blown away that I was at a school concert. It was so, it just sounded so, so great. And um, Angela, your boys were were quite the entertainment. <laughs> thank you. I got a kick out of that. Um, but yes, um, so thank you and congratulations to Mrs. Shack for doing a great job with the band concert. Sandy. Yeah, um, I just quickly. Um, wanted to talk about I uh, I did stop by the. Um, the craft show that they had at uh, Manassi's or Maniachi's, however you want to say it, uh, and I did run into the uh, National Junior Honor Society doing their bake sale, and they had a lot of items there. And I was talking to the girls that were there, and they did a lot of the baking themselves, which I thought was pretty. I was pretty impressed by. So, um, just kudos to them for doing that on their own. Um, and they were there working it and everything themselves. So that was awesome, good for them. Uh, and I also um, wanted to um, just say real quickly, uh, for the stuff, the bus that happened on Saturday, uh, when I came to drop off my donations, the individuals working that, collecting them, were, were very, very positive, very, very thankful, um, and it was, uh, it was very nice. They weren't like it was, you know, all crabby. It was cold or nothing. They were they were very mm -hmm. thankful, welcoming, and uh, the kids working it were fantastic. 
they were very energetic and jumped right up to help me with everything and stuff. The kids were great, so thank you. Angel? I'm all set, thank you. Kelly? Um, I'm guessing Connor's probably going to elaborate on this a little bit, but um, the football banquet was awesome. We had a bunch of uh, our young men that are going to, what did they guys make, state? The state? I don't know, he'll tell you what the award was. I don't know. Yeah, we had two, uh, two all states. Yeah, and that's then it. we had, um, for the first time ever actually I was talking to Coach Misco about this, we had eight seniors make all of the state academic, yes. and then for the first time ever, we were all state academic as a team. Awesome. Yes. That was that was awesome. Nice. Yes, there were a lot of a lot of great awards that were given out that night. Um, and then also the wrestling meet, Richmond um, came in second overall, and I think we actually a lot of our kids took some really good places. So good job, guys. And me, you guys kind of like hit all the things yeah. that I have. However, I just want to thank Margaret for putting together or at least working on the Sandy's kids went really well and I know it's a it's a good program and it's a it's it is given back to our community and that's what I think it's all about I too watched the eSports I had to figure out like <coughs> who was what with the little carts moving around but it was really cool to watch yeah I, I agree with Margaret I'm not a gamer either so I learned all kinds of new things um, it, was, it was good it was good um, I let's see there's uh, I too went to the craft show and uh, actually, there's two cookies or two plates of cookies here that I bought from them. <laughs> I'm not going to tell who. No. <laughs> and I, that's it for me. Okay. Next item, Connor, you're up. Our student report. <laughs> Alright, starting off in the elementary school, uh, school, students at the elementary are enjoying buying gifts for the loved ones. At the Secret Santa Shop, it is a great way to teach uh, being selfless and how to think of others during Christmas. Um, students are working hard on reading books for AR re uh, the Reader Program. The first duck days are coming up on Friday. And preschool is practicing for their Christmas program this week. The program will be held on Monday, December 18th. We're excited to invite our families into the building as the holiday season approaches. Families will also head to the classroom after the performance to enjoy the classroom Christmas parties. In the middle school, there's a lot going on at RMS. The week begins at the Battle of the Bays. Students <laughs> will decorate their lockers with holiday cheer and will be judged by a secret panel of judges. Winners will be announced at our Christmas assembly on December 22nd. Next week on Wednesday, December 20th, RMS will host 7th and 8th graders for a winter dance from 5 to 7 in the middle school cafeteria. Tickets will be $5 and are on sale this week during lunch. Uh, girls basketball in the middle school is wrapping up. Um, everyone is so proud of the 7th and 8th grade student athletes. Our girls basketball teams are also participating in the Moon Beams for Sweet Dreams at Royal Oak Beaumont Hospital on Thursday, December 15th at 6.30. Uh, last week, our combined bands had their holiday concert. The student musicians from both middle school and high school put on an amazing show under the direction of Mrs. Shack. Next week, our combined choirs will have their Christmas show on Tuesday, December 19th at 7 p.m. in the high school auditorium. As you know, our RMS index report was released and we are very proud to show improvements in almost all areas. And from the staff and students at RMS, we would like to wish the Board of Education a very Merry Christmas and a fantastic New Year. Uh, to the high school, on Saturday the eSports team won their state title for the Mario Kart races. Congrats to Talon, Lucas, Roland, Ethan, and coaches Mrs. Campo and Mr. Hill. Student government is currently uh, running a Kids in Distress clothing drive. Uh, the items needed uh, to be donated include a hygiene products, socks, underwear, coats, and other winter gear, and or uh, boy or girl clothing, preferably sizes 6 through 18 to 20. Uh, we are asking that all items are either new or gently used. Drop-offs are right on the inside door of the high school. Um, the high school also has a giving tree in the front foyer uh, with 
colon necessities. Students are welcome to help themselves to what they need in the coming months. 14 students attended the Macomb Community College Auto Steam Days this past week on Thursday where students were able to explore careers and skilled trade opportunities in a variety of areas. The choir concert is scheduled for December 19th at 7 p.m. in the auditorium and Holiday Spirit Weeks is being hosted by student government next week. Students can listen for the themes of each day on the daily announcements and there will be sign, uh, signs will be posted in the halls when the um, polling drive comes to an end. And then coming from the athletics, um, boys basketball starts their season off uh, going one and one with an opening night win over Kingston 47 or 48 to 37 last Tuesday at home. The girls basketball is also one and one to start their season as they just defeated Carlo Moody 43 to 17 on Saturday. Uh, the wrestling team had their annual George Hamlet Invitational at RHS on Saturday. Uh, we had six wrestlers make uh, the finals um, with Wyatt Peters, Jacob Fink, Aiden Bergeon, and myself taking second, and then Matthew Mish and Joey Jarvis took first place in their weight classes. Uh, we will travel to Ohio this weekend for the Roughneck Bulls at Finley University. Anyone have any questions for Connor? So they don't have that. Um, the donation bin, they didn't have a date when everything had to be in yet? Um, I believe um, we said it's just this week, so Monday just this Friday. Week. It's, I think it's this Friday, it's the 15th. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. I also did see the tree when we came in, and our, like, what group is responsible for doing that tree? Is that just the... Did you say yeah, that? I'm not no. sure. I know I know it's not student government. It's not I, um, okay. I believe it was Miss Abel. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Based on what she told me. So I know Miss Honnold was putting it up on yes. Friday. It wasn't any students or anything. Okay. So, yeah, student, student government is running the, the high dean uh, the the drive, and it. then um, the clothing tree is, I believe, from Miss Abel. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Wansley, uh, Superintendent, and legislative update. Uh, just reiterating, uh, congratulations to the band members. It was a phenomenal concert. I know you've heard it multiple times. And then um, Claire uh, Reinhardt, good luck to her. Um, she, we have so many talented musicians, and I could easily see more of our students moving forward to getting this, this honor. Um, you saw tonight the 10 students. It was a very hard decision. Um, you know, next year we anticipate having more art exhibits submitted, um, but just another piece to uh, highlight our, our successes in our district. Um, you know, special thank you to Board Member Telto and the whole crew that organized Sandy's Kids. This is our 10th year doing it. Um, we've raised roughly $30,000 in 10 years and turned around and gave about 20000 of it back. Um, to families in need, so it's it has grown each year. So I know it's a lot of work. So thank you for doing that, um, uh, Kelly. Thank you for stepping up Saturday, um, Mr. Kendall. I had uh, Mr. Thiel reached out to him. He has had surgery. He's up and walking, um, doing well. So uh, I appreciate it uh, from this the incident that happened this weekend. Uh, just a reminder: the legislators have adjourned. Uh, there are two special elections for House seats, um, and, and there's not much, we don't anticipate much movement in the House uh, until those elections are done, because that will determine potentially a majority of, of the House. Um, why do I bring this up? Is because as we're beginning the budget season after the first of the year, I don't anticipate we're going to get any House budget until the end of April, beginning of May even have an idea of where the house is going to be at, which will make our job a little more challenging or some assumptions that we're going to have to make um, um, just because of the, the politics that has to unfold um, over the next couple months. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, item of, items of interest from the board. Margaret, you got one oh, first yeah. in. Okay. Um, mix them up. <laughs> what? I mix, mix them, them up. Yeah. All right. Um, I just have. Um, I have my button on here tonight that I'm going to wear um, through the end of the boys' basketball season. But um, 
towards the end of last week, I don't, I don't know what day, but there, a social media post was put out um, about our bas boys varsity basketball team, um, our, our coach, and one of our kids on the basketball team, number three. Um, wholly inappropriate, disgusting, um, and I just, I'm making a stand that I'm going to make sure I get to a game when I'm going to be number three span. Um, I don't believe that there's any place, um, first off, to say anything about coaches over social media. Uh, it's a hard enough job to be a coach, and we certainly don't talk about, on social media, about playing time for kids. That's not a parent thing, and then you sure as heck don't go and put something out calling out a particular child. Um, it's appalling to me. And um, so I'm going to have my button, whipped it together, and um, I know a little bit about number three, and it's even more appalling that this child was focused on, so I just want him to know that he, I know I'm saying it, but I know every person that I'm sitting with this this table doesn't ever think that that's good. And I know that uh, Mr. Walmsley and Mr. Trend are doing things to take care of the matter, and if any board member wants to ask them, they can, they can ask, because I'm not going to give it any more publicness than it already has. So that's it. Go number three. Thank you. Yeah, Angela. I'm all set. Thank you. Sandy. I do not have anything. Come on, guys. I'm trying to take notes here. Kelly. Nope. Good. Candice. Um, so Tuesday night, I was able to attend the Centerline MSBA dinner, um, the monthly dinner. And I just have to say, I think we are so lucky that we have Ms. Sable coming from that high school because their CTE program just blew me away. Obviously, that, that was their key point for that dinner. And um, we, I was able to be walked through from their ambassadors from the entry point on down the hall. And um, the whole ideology of that school from eighth grade when they're picking their classes is to already pre-pick a career um, path and just to have um, been walked through that whole um, process and the ambassador took us through every single hallway and how every hallway was designated for each of those paths and um, I, I think we're very lucky I, I'm excited I know this is only the stable second or third year here but I'm super excited to see um, how she kind of brings us to a little bit more of what's going on there because that was super cool, all of it, um, including, actually, Kelly, you would have liked this. There were, we walked past two of the students that were in full-on military uniform. And so there's some military program that they have that by the time they graduate, yeah, by the time they graduate high school and they apply for the military, they're already in a second ranking. They're getting already paid more money. The prep for officer yes. program. Mm -hmm. So it was it was a really neat um, thing. I, mine aren't in high school yet, so I haven't been exposed to that. So it was for me. It was a learning lesson and just that's, it was a great one to go to. I think this angle is already started by that piece of equipment we're going to yeah. get. And the uh, ambulance, they had that and one the ambulance. Ambulance. Yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, Danielle? I'm good. Uh, my only comment is I just want to reinforce what uh, Margaret said as far as her comments tonight. Um, there is no place for that in our community, period. Okay, next item, public comments. Uh, I said, yeah. What? Did you get her? Did I miss you? Nope. You didn't Danielle? ask Danielle? I have my sticks. Oh, no. no I'm, all right. I'm good. Did I ask Sandy? Did I ask? I thought I did. I no, she did. No, you did. I just didn't know. I just didn't realize you asked everybody else. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, because I, I, I okay. do that so I know. <laughs> <laughs> because I will lose. <laughs> trying to do it. Okay, public comments. Since the last board meeting, I have not received any emails from the public. Uh, we had no public comments at the last board meeting, so I have nothing to report. 
At this time, any member of the public may address the board. Please sign in and state your name. You'll have three minutes to address the board. Are there any public comments? Seeing no public comments, we're going to move on. Our next item is um, our closed session, so I'm looking for a motion to go into closed session. Pursuant to Section 8A of the Michigan Open Meetings Act, and upon the request of the superintendent, I move that the Board of Education go into closed session to consider the periodic personnel evaluation of the superintendent. Do I have support? Support. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Motion for the approval of the resolution for summer tax collection. I move to accept the recommendation of the superintendent and impose a summer property tax levy to collect all school property taxes in each city or township in which the, this district is located as outlined in the attached resolution. Do I have support? Support. Go ahead. We'll get Sandy. to Sandy. Sorry. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I'm looking for a motion for the approval of an overnight extended trip request. I move to accept the recommendation of the superintendent and approve the overnight slash extended student trip to Grand Rapids, Michigan and the estimated expenses of $1,500 as outlined in the attached documentation. Do I have support? Support. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I'm looking for a motion for the approval of a bus purchase. I move. Oh, go ahead. I motion to accept the recommendation of the superintendent and approve the purchase of one school bus from Midwest Transit for a total not to exceed $143,379 as outlined in the attached documentation for which funding transferred from the general fund to the non-bond capital projects fund. Support. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? I just want to point it's out. an increase from last year. The, the buses several years ago, pre-COVID, you see about $83,000, dollars yes. They are already nearing 150 when you look at all of the, the components, but yeah. So are we getting more money for them then when we are like selling them or auctioning them also on that end or no? We got a little more this past one, but <laughs> yeah. not, 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 not nothing. nothing. Right. It really varies on probably what's available from you know, sure. the timing of so many people are converting these buses now. I thought maybe we would get a little bit more money, but it's we'll get a little bit more money. Okay. Not, this isn't an electric bus, is it? That's no. what I was going to ask. This is the cost then. Of course. The electric right. bus is yeah. over half a million dollars. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, so then you have to install the new charge. The new right? yes, yeah, charge. Yeah, right? Yes. Yeah. Thing. And yep. maintain that. Yeah. yeah. I read that Armada has one. And the they do. They got a, they got a, a grant 80, from the uh, um, federal government. But the problem they have in the geographic location, the charge to stay the whole route. Are we talking about oh. we're, we're 50 oh, square miles? Yeah, when you think the miles that you're yeah. driving, yes. Yeah. I heard so. it sounds like a plane going by your house, too. Really? <laughs> like, like a plane's going to crash. You think they're quiet. That's not what people were really talking about, but interesting. Okay, so do I go for it? Okay, this is any discussion besides what we did. Okay, this is a roll call vote. Uh, Candace? Aye. Margaret? Aye. Kelly? Aye. Sandy? Aye. Angela? Aye. Danielle? Aye. And I vote aye. Motion carries. Okay, I'm looking for a motion for the approval of the 11th Amendment of contract for the superintendent. Do we have to change any of that? No. No. I move to approve okay. the 11th Amendment of the contract for the superintendent as presented in the attached documentation. We have support. Support. Angela. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I'm looking for the uh, a motion for the approval of a CTE computer lab purchase. 
move to accept the recommendation of the superintendent and approve the purchase of 35 computer monitors, drives, and peripheral equipment from Inacom TSG for a total not to exceed $60,235 as outlined in the attached documentation for which funding from the general fund 61A.1 vocational education funds is authorized. Do I have support? Support. Support. Kelly. Yes. Any discussion? This is none of this is covered by the grants. <coughs> this, this is a specific grant for CTE funds. 61, 61A. Oh. 61A okay. um, is, is CTE funds. Oh, okay. Okay, this is a roll call vote. Um, Margaret. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Candace. Aye. Sandy. Aye. Angela. Aye. Danielle. Aye. I vote aye. Motion carries. Being no further business, the board will adjourn at 9.51. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Merry Christmas.